kind of yeah it's creating the, the quality of the products and the services that are being shaped and uh, we thought that maybe it would be interesting to, to think about how to repaint or reintegrate some of the philosophical foundation again into design so that philosophy now is in the academic circles it's a matter of uh, let's say uh, elitistic and very highly specialized and it's, it's it's actually very difficult if it's not secondhand philosophy <laughs> jordan peeps <laughs> <laughs> so philosophy for the masses you, you get really really deep philosophy and really superficial philosophy and i think we need to maintain a level of complexity and depth with it but that would be very useful for design because it's so polarized and even the most basic building blocks of it that are being contested we have some of these proposals and I think one would be that designers could really benefit from a philosophical foundation or a bridge to, to, to become better designers through it. But, you know, the difficulty comes from what literature is relevant to this, to becoming a designer when it comes to philosophy. Do you go read Hegel, Heidegger, Nietzsche? What, what do you do? And how do you actually train with thinking? Where do you get your education? Is it informal, just self-taught? go get a philosophy degree you know these are all different problems that arise and i think you know the the fact that we want to bring them together can at least you know stir the conversation to see if people are appreciating philosophy or they're seeing it as this really cold domain with very complex words that lead you anywhere or there is some value to design so i think this is kind of the starting point if you want to add anything else kevin uh well that's uh it's already a, a really good beginning of the i mean I, I think it's a good start for the discussion um one of the thing we usually try to explore in this conversation is how everyone relates to that kind of subjects like how useful we find it in in our in the way we want to work or the kind of ideas that it generates and help us um uh discover um uh, yeah to to me i i i think i discovered i mean i i went in this uh rabbit hole of philosophy uh which is philosophy uh by accident uh and it was mainly through um through critical thinking and um and um like to me rediscovering like what what are good methods for you know uh, like uh, having a, a better understanding of what we what we are doing and how we can judge the quality of what we are doing not just by our own tastes but in the sense that now we we can share those uh those perspectives with others and make understanding of what is good as, as design and, and design in that sense is linked to philosophy in, in the sense that probably questions what what we all define as as good and as important and as desirable in you know in what in what we are trying to create right so um, this is one of the entry points I guess um, for this kind of discussion but yeah open to to see how everyone of like everyone just relate to those this kind of subject. I'd like to, to know what the others think about this like what is their uh, connection to philosophy if they can see a connection to philosophy in their work and also you know the, the Matt and Alexei if you want to introduce yourself so we know what kind of designers you are we're also maybe give a round to, to introduce ourselves to you as well mm. Yeah, I don't like so I, I, I not see the designer, but I'm, I'm sorry. We, we don't hear you so well, Matt. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's like it's it's really um, as you as you were, you are far from the mic. Or I don't know. It's, it's not oh. clear. Is it is it a little bit better here? Oh, yeah. Yeah. OK, perfect. Um, so I'm, I'm not a designer. I'm not a professional designer. Uh, I'm not even a professional philosopher or, or, or uh, academic, but I am very interested in philosophy. Um, and I, I, 
my background is actually uh, in uh, petroleum engineering um, uh, and uh, renewable energy management. Uh, I was an asset manager for um, a, a solar developer for uh, about four years. Um, and one of the things that I'm really interested in is in AI and uh, applied uh, sciences. Um, and I, I, I studied uh, a little bit of philosophy. I've read, you know, uh, uh, philosophical texts like Kant and stuff like that. And um, one of the things that I'm currently looking at is, you know, how to apply um, some kind of mathematical rigor into understanding how we think a little bit better. You know, it's one of those things where philosophy from generation to generation often have to, uh, often tries to reinvent itself because it's stuck in a rut, right? And it's, it's a type of Hegelian type of dialectic where you have to find its complete opposite in its current state in order to discover um, uh, the new state. And so uh, one of the you know, key insights right now, the iteration that we're in is kind of this postmodern uh, Wittgensteinian, like we, we don't really have a full grasp of what we're actually talking about. And, um, and this is kind of the reason why in popular culture, we have these buzzwords like AI, because if humans don't know, you know, how to, how to really describe what we're really talking about, and we don't really even have anything to really talk about, then we, we don't say anything. And so we let, we, we, we have to find efficiencies, um, you know, through, through AI and machine learning and through companies, right? When I think about philosophy in like the ancient Greek sense, you know, you think about that they're basically slave owners, right? Because those ancient philosophers, they had a lot of leisure time. They were able to uh, think uh, rationally and they didn't have to exert too much labor. Now, the weight that they, you know, um, justify this, this type of activity is that they find efficiencies, right? They, they, they learn um, natural philosophy. You know, they, under, they study, you know, biology. They, they advance uh, medicine and these are types of like efficiencies that justify types of activities. And so, um, yeah, so basically I'm going into like, you know, uh, information theory and trying to discover, you know, um, kind of like a, a, a theory about how uh, humans derive this type of efficiency through, um, through this type of organizational like um, uh, hierarchy in a sense, but yeah. Hmm. That's really, really interesting. I'm seeing a lot of uh, connections. I mean, you, you really did your homework. And I think, you know, <laughs> this part of, you know, preparing for whatever you were trying to do, you know, this is really important, especially around the information theory. What came to mind was this uh, philosophy of the mind which is kind of the, the, the overarching theme that brings in the agents with the AI and also the information theory as how we structure beliefs, decisions, and information in general. And what do we consider knowledge to be? So that's interesting. Yeah. Who goes next? Um, if I may ask Matt, sorry, before, before we do the rounds, yeah. what is the formula in the chat? It kind of intrigued me. Oh, yeah. Ah, that formula is actually called the Shannon Hartley uh, formula. So Sh uh, Claude Shannon is actually the father of uh, modern information theory. Yes. So in 1948, he wrote a master's thesis where it's really just about, you know, like how you can basically make general computing out of binary, right? So that's, mm -hmm. you know, binary is essentially what makes digital digital. And it's actually log based too. I didn't write the two down, but it's basically saying how, how efficient is it to convert data into information? So C is considered the, is, is called the capacity, the Shannon capacity limit, mm -hmm. and that's information. B equals bandwidth. So in terms of like a human brain can only handle, you know, like seven bits of information at a time, right? Like you can't remember, you can't play around with more than seven concepts. Right, it's, it's a little bit too abstract to try to think about 
how to manipulate hundreds of different operations or memorize, you know, a list of more than like 10, right? Uh, so, so that's the B. But, you know, of course, like computers have much higher Bs. And um, one way to improve Bs, by the way, is to do some kind of data compression. So this is where um, design and philosophy kind of mix and really reinforce one another. Because if you have to deal with a lot of information, but the, mo the, the important information is highlighted for you, then that increases your B, right? It's a it's type of a, a data compression type of thing, right? And, uh, and so like these types of good UI UX increases the Bs. The, the S and N are the signal to noise ratio. So if you think about it, um, you can actually discover that uh, if, you, if you have a very high um, accuracy, but then all of a sudden you lose accuracy from like 100% down to 80%, you would actually lose 50% of your information. So that means you would have to hire twice the amount of people in order to like retain the same amount of like uh, performance, right? So you know these these types of uh, these types of uh, information theory that quantitatively um, you know expresses these things also you know play into you know how how humans operate and not just how you know machines do it. So. Elon Musk said something like uh, that information theory might even be more um, fundamental than the laws of physics, right? Mm. And we can trust Elon Musk on what he says. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> so, who wants to go next? Maybe, uh, maybe I can uh, say uh, a few words. So uh, I'm Krasi. I'm a, not a designer by uh, background, but I'm uh, sorry, by education, but by, I'm a designer by practice. And uh, I had a chance to be actually introduced to the field of ph philosophy uh, by Diana because we work together. So prior to that, it never occurred to me that um, this would enrich my uh, perspective and uh, the way I uh, view things. But um, <clears throat> working with her and being exposed to some of these uh, theories and ideas actually, mm, I believe, made me more critical thinker because I'm able to uh, dismantle some of the complex uh, uh, ideas and explore the connections in a much more richer depth. Um, and um, it's, um, yeah, I find that uh, it's very challenging and tough uh, to work on uh, abstract level, but at the same time, if you manage to to get to the essence of things and uh, think about the interrelationship and the uh, correlation and causality, it, um, it makes your work uh, more, more crisp and at certain level of depth for sure. Well, I'm happy to have passed that on. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Diana. Yes, so as Chris said, we work together. We are doing some strategic design tool creation. And I, I think it's uh, philosophy. I mean, I studied philosophy, so that's how I leaped towards design. And it struck me as one of the most, I don't know, fitting paths, actually, with the design. And it, it was surprising to me that people are not there are no more philosophers in design, given that it's such a good foundation to start with. Rather than, I mean, it's it's valuable to do design as a, an education, as an academic education. But I think it's even more valuable to to deepen it with philosophy. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's what brought us here to this frustration. And I think that the depth and the complexity of thinking became really valuable because we had to find a way to get out of the polarization, a way to not debate, but actually explore and understand connections deeper rather than trying to be right, trying to understand something and get to a common understanding together. And I think this should be maybe uh, a path to 
uh, give a new sense of value to to design and enrich it in a way that it wasn't so know, possible before. I guess I can go next. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm Udipta. I am a junior researcher and designer. I'm currently based in India. I'm probably also the most um, uneducated in terms of philosophy here. But yeah, I, I just completed my computer science bachelor's recently. And yeah, I'm just interested in uh, having becoming a part of these kinds of discussions. Hi there, so I'm Jonathan, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. So I, the same as all the others, I'm not really an expert in philosophy. I have a background in uh, physics and so science. And I also got to design from kind of uh, in a kind of serendipitous way through my different activities. And what I found really interesting is I'm a bit of a generalist. I, I've done, I, I like doing a lot of different things. I, I like uh, playing music. I, I like science. I like uh, um, making films. So I've lots of different interests, but the only field that has made me dive into philosophy is design. And I found that quite an interesting, uh, I, I was wondering why, if it's, if, if it's just because uh, there's a deep interest there or if the thing about the field itself that, uh, you know, pulls us towards philosophy. And I actually believe there's something about the field and I, I don't, I've not thought about this a lot, but I suspect it's got to do with the fact that what we're dealing with when we're designing is notions of value and what can be more philosophical as a theme than, than value. How do we, uh, if you start from value, I think that's one of the deepest philosophical themes. It probably connects to most of the philosophical themes. And, and I think it's also useful to try and dissect what what are the fields of philosophy? Because philosophy is obviously very all-encompassing. I mean, it, it, it deals with everything. So uh, I think it's, it's also nice to kind of maybe go one level down and think about what are the actual uh, subfields of philosophy that connect to design and how they connect to design. So, for instance, I think metaphysics, what is the nature of reality and things and how we interact with things is an interesting thing that Aristotle already talked about, causality, four causes, Aristotle's four causes, ethics, you know, what, sh what is, sh should we do, what, what is good to do, or what is bad, and of course, aesthetics, what, how do things look, so you have all these different subfields, and I, and I think all of these tie back to design, and so, yeah, so basically, I think that's a, uh, it's, it's, that's why I'm interested in it, and um, that's about it. Um, so I'm a UX UI designer. Uh, I'm in Switzerland, and I'm here because uh, I, I was looking for a new way in design to merge something new and make my my product more significant for the users. So when I, I see that the subject is interesting, so that's why I'm here, but I don't have any background in philosophy. Thank you. Mark, do you want to say a word? Sure. Hi. Uh, yeah, so my background is actually in architecture and in architectural education ties Kind of making and philosophy together um, and so it felt like a really natural fit for me and I was kind of surprised when I left architecture and moved kind of more into the design world that those concepts don't follow necessarily 
Um, so I'm, I'm interested in it, um, I think, because I think about what we do in really material ways. And if you're acting on the world, then you should probably understand it. Um, and so it, it feels like a really natural fit for me um, that there's you know, philosophical aspects. Of it. Like Jonathan said, I mean, like the ethics of making, uh, kind of concepts of materiality, um, even things like uh, drama or persuasion in terms of rhetoric or stuff like that. I think there's a, there's a ton to learn from um, you know an entire history of thinking about who we are and how we are in the world. So uh, yeah, to me it's it's I, I find it really difficult to not think about those things when I'm making something. So <laughs> I feel I feel like it's a good fit for sure. Yeah, I mean, we already mapped a lot of areas that philosophy kind of touches and it's, you know, integrated in it and given birth to these areas. And also it, yeah, it continues to like pierce through, even though we don't think we have a philosophical background, we have acquired some components of it because we learned something related to design. You know, I was thinking about the first thing that struck me is like, yes, aesthetics. It's first, it's how you see. And then there's the logic of how you actually the product development or, you know, there's how do you understand the, the logic of a user as well? If you can condition or nudge or whatever decisions you make, then you tie it into the ethics. And then you mm -hmm. think about the values that you're promoting and uh, yeah, going into critical thinking, how you question the validity of your solutions. And then even deeper into, I like what Matt said about the data compression and the fact that there's this relationship almost to shape and structure the way when you were saying that I, I thought about the antennas you know like the the first antennas with like the you know the like the i don't know the, those straight poles and then now you have the round ones which have an internal structure that it's more fit to uh for information you know it, it's i think this is it's really interesting and me even thinking about biomimicry i think that's a one interesting field when you don't know philosophy you can just kind of learn from nature and you get this intimate relationship with how you you can create but i think one drawback to philosophy is the incapacity to bring creative thinking or to even say it that it's about creativity mm. it just it, it makes you kneel down in front of these monstrous philosophers that you can barely hope to understand and it yeah it doesn't the way it's being taught and presented, it's so intimidating, I think. So when it comes to design, how do you think we could do a better job if we are to reconcile this relationship in a way that it's not oversimplifying the, the benefits? That's a good question. Uh, I may, I may try to start <laughs> to have some thoughts about it. So, um, I mean, I mean, something that we, I guess something that comes from design is, um, uh, some kind of intrinsic motivation through curiosity that we have, that is a good start. I would say in general, that we want to understand something. That's a, that has its limit, especially in something that is can be really technical in, in some in some form as 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 philosophy can can get. But um, it's a it's a good place to start, and um, I would say also not to be afraid really about the subjects because when you look at their concrete application in the world, like how many people said. I took this concept from Kant and I applied it like literally in the world. Like no one do, does that, right? And 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 in fact, no one is really interested in doing that because it's more about the discussion and the kind of of like like the creativity in philosophy. I, I, I would say, especially from a classical approach to philosophy, is more about the debate that generates new ideas and how to defend a certain position. And this is one of the I would say in some places of philosophy, it's one of the main point of doing philosophy is 
being able to stand a you know uh, on a position more than anything else which is which is uh, an art by itself but it's not the only type of thing that you can get from philosophy right but but it's it's sometimes perceived as such and um i would say like if it's it's if it's if you take the concepts and and you try to see what it means to to your work as a designer you sometimes find it's just hard to just apply it because they have no affordances and you know how you should use it in reality right just about the concepts and the ideas and the type of thinking that goes with it and um and and this is where you can just make this exercise of trying to deconstruct a bit the the big idea into smaller like more like um easier to use pieces that you can see how it affects what you are doing right but this is the like for be beginning about this question i i guess this is how how far i can and go right now i don't know if anyone else has uh, some idea but um i i would i would say like the temptation of being afraid about the concepts because this sounds like really deep and complicated sometimes is here but yeah but the fact that it's not really applied makes it like okay that's a big thing but how does it translate in it's like if you take business ethics and you see what people do in business ethics like you are far from the big concepts of philosophy right it's like it's 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 big like it dissociated themselves from from those kind of big major topics that you can see like in in classical or more historic type of uh, philosophical approaches i don't know maybe i'm i'm wrong on that but this is how i well, i, I the, feel the joke we have here is that the thinnest book we ever read was a book on business ethics <laughs> Yeah, well, it, it, if it's about compliance, as it is most of the time, then it's it's really not interesting in terms of you know it, it has no, it, it does not really contain any any bits of philosophical uh, approach, right? It's just about rules and like it's. I, I do think what you said about the kind of I don't know if the right term is like the transportability or the direct translation of concepts from one sphere into another, I think is a, I, I think it's a, it's a really interesting concept in what happens when you translate from one to another. I mean, as designers, we are, um, I think we tend towards action, right? We wanna act on the world. We, we're curious about problems, but we're curious not as an end in itself, but as a means to an end of, of acting. Right, and so the the trans any I know like text or school of thought or anything like that needs to undergo some kind of metamorphosis between the written work or however it is you do it and and that mode of action, and I find that translation to be a really interesting and uh, kind of difficult to mm -hmm. pin down. Um, yeah, you know, in a space, right. I kind of want to bring up a very concrete problem. And it's a problem that cannot be solved without a type of spirit that comes from outside and looks at it and says, we got to change this, okay? This problem is called the Peter Principle, okay? You might have heard about this. It's that um, you are all, everyone is promoted to the point where they cannot get promoted again. So they, they get promoted to their level of incompetence, right? That means in steady state of society, everybody in their job is incompetent, right? Because everybody gets promoted to where they cannot get promoted anymore. And so then they suck at their jobs. And so they're not supposed to be where they are, but we have this type of ethics where we reward everybody who is meritocratically good, right? Like you promote your best work. You might promote them into management, but 
to managers. They're actually better. You turn them into product managers, for instance. Sorry, go ahead. Did you want to say something? But anyways, what, what I really wanted to mention was that, you know, it's design thinking that sees this, where it's a counterintuitive logic, where you're trying to create a meritocratic system, but, but the misapplication of it being at kind of the short-term promotion level might actually create an overall systemic effect that is not ethical at all towards that goal. And so it, you require this type of design thinking to fix this. But the designer who encounters this problem has to source some kind of inspiration from the outside, like way, way outside. Because combating peer principle is, 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 is a very difficult task. All of a sudden you have to, you have to like, you have to destroy all the compliance, you know, and business ethics books and just like start from scratch. You have to like take inventory of each individual person. Like you have to go into like 10 X or hundred X on the data of each of your in employees. You know, it becomes an exercise and an enterprise all on its own. And this is where, you know, the rubber meets the road is that, well, in order to really fix this problem, you have to probably not do it on the enterprise level, but do it on, you know, kind of like on the consumer level where you take their data, you know, the, the employee's data, but to, to that level where they trust you, kind of like Google, right? Everybody has a Gmail account. So the data is already there. And so, yeah, I don't know. But I just wanted to offer the peer principle as just kind of like an anchor to think about how uh, design needs to look at counterintuitive issues, right? And try to fix those. Uh, if I could just comment on that. So, I mean, I think the principle assumes a lot of things. Firstly, I think there's a lot of assumptions hiding behind this principle. Uh, that's the first thing. And the second is that this is not a uniquely, uh, it, this is not uniquely a, a problem for designers. I mean, this is a problem you could also apply to all sorts of other uh, professions, it seems to me. Although as design is a field that is kind of searching for a frame for itself, somehow maybe people are more conscious about it but i mean you could make the same argument for a, a manager and I, I and i i don't i'm and thirdly i'm not sure i completely agree with the fact that you have to know because if i understand what you're saying correctly it, it, there's this notion that okay a designer should basically know how to do what everyone else is doing Basically, yes, he's an all-encompassing kind of person who needs to have all sorts of skills, and that basically is going to. This is impossible because of the. Yeah, I mean, we can reason about a, a, a much wider field. Of things if we if we change the level of abstraction upon which we reason a ceo can manage his company uh without knowing all the details of what's going on and i think it's you can apply the same kind of reasoning for someone in design <laughs> oh, right I, I mean i'm i'm in agreement with you that um uh that Anyone who is not a designer can use design principles to attempt to solve problems and to look at a problem in a different light um, in order to see uh, what an issue is. And I, I don't mean that a designer needs to be, um, you know, Da Vinci-esque, right? Um, mm -hmm. what, what, I, what I do mean is that this, this type of design mentality, like design mentality um, is probably what is required to, to look at, 
you know, this this problem like the peer principle, and uh, and and be a contrarian there, and and mm -hmm. and see from from uh, you know the, the forest from the trees type of thing, right? To see it from a, a broader perspective, because for individual workers and specialists who might have great titles uh, within their respective fields, they might be too much of a specialist to to diagnose. Um, problem of this sort, right? And, and I agree. I, I mean, I, I only bring up this uh, as just an example of where um, counterintuition, counter um, you know, kind of requires a, a different type of thinking. Yeah. If I, if I just may say something about what I believe is important to maybe to not to have like a same definition, but some common understanding of what we mean by design. I, I just want to provide just my definition and, and, and then you do whatever you want with it. Okay, but just my definition. And, and, and so you understand what I mean when I talk about design in general. And, and so to me, design is the type of activities or processes that helps us create mediums for interaction. So we create things that are the catalyst for the change we want to see. And this is the kind of thing that makes design what it is in a sense that we, we intend to change the world, but through something, through a medium, whatever it is, like a, it can be a process, it can be a product, it can be an application, a website, who cares? It's not really, really important to define it, but it's important to, to agree on the fact that we want to design, we want to create something to make that change happen, which is a bit different, I would say from maybe like, it, it can encompass like a lot of other professions that do some kind of things that are similar to that, but, but, but not all. So we can distinguish here some kind of patterns that comes from designers in general that we, we intend to create this, this medium. And, and then we, we can create a medium to solve something, to fix it, as you, as you mentioned, Matt, but we, we can also create something to, to dissolve the situation or to resolve, like there's some kind of other levels of uh, where we can, where we can try, to, try to act. Um, then it begs the question, how far it is the role and the responsibility of the designer to necessarily do it? Right, so it's where it's where I would say it, it grounds the discussion into the ethics part of philosophy, which is like, I mean, when we talk about product, um, some kind of thing that tend to have like a, a relationship to a group of people, but but we don't want to change like like you, like in the principle that you mentioned, Matt, where we want to change the relationship about everyone and their title or everyone and the type of work they are trying to do. Like you, we, we want to, to, to have an impact on a, a really large scale. Um, the question is, is one person like should be entitled to do it? Right. And, uh, and, and which, which part of you or which type of position is he or she will decide to, to, to take, to decide, to make the change that, that he or she expect to see, right? And then this will not necessarily, I'm not like an, um, a, a, like I'm not in the side of Kant and, and, and the idea that actions are necessarily good, good and bad. Um, so I don't think that uh, we don't, we have like some kind of process that like magically necessarily brings out like good outcomes. Um, but there are processes that ensures that we are less likely to do more, more, more harm, or at least to uh, overlook certain biases that we, that we might have. And yeah, I, I just want to bring those, those things, but I tend to like find really interesting the discussion. I, I think we, we kind of, uh, you know, uh, went a bit further than just the, the, the initial question, but that's perfect. That's the, <laughs> we, <laughs> the kind of thing we want to see. I don't know if you have any any thoughts on what has been said so far. I think it's a, what you're saying 
might be useful to actually feed back into the conceptions that we've built around philosophy. And philosophy has tried to, to dismantle some of these biases, especially in the 20th century. Uh, the fact that it's not uh, necessarily to, to, to look at uh, as an aimless form of circumvoluted thinking where you just, I don't know, the philosopher is alone sitting and just uh, contemplating and then coming up with these amazing statements. And uh, yeah, I think now for design and you know the, the, the way I see it developed is to, to bring this level of humility to the fact that we can't do these things alone. And we have to uh, take to place more value on the the group discussion and how important it is. But I think you know the the, the disadvantage or maybe the drawback of all our discussions sometimes is that we don't have the philosophical power to continue them. You know, in a in a, an academic environment, they're discussing and they're passing drafts and they're like really building something they have a very specific aim to maybe publish a paper or something but when we think about this design and philosophy i think our aim is a bit vaguer and it would be useful to actually think what functions can we per, can philosophy perform into aiding certain components of what we think design and design thinking and other design practices might benefit from because i actually tried to map something as you were all talking mm -hmm. a very specific very simple diagram and if you can see it but it's basically like we start with the form the most common form of thinking which is critical thinking and then you kevin mentioned this uh, the deconstruction and you had this discussion with matt and it made me think about how important it is to actually be able to dive into the epistemology into mm -hmm. breaking things apart and like Matt was saying, translating this is so valuable to, to, to us as designers and as people in general. But then it got me thinking, what comes after? And I think the answer is creative thinking. You need a good foundation for that to, to be able to reconstruct or to repurpose or to reinvent the, the concepts that you're uh, appropriating. And of course, that's when you finally begin to get to design thinking. You don't start design thinking with the classic design thinking process and empathize the idea. Then all of a sudden you, you understand what design thinking is about. I think it's much deeper than that. And taking this route could give it the depth and the, uh, yeah, a better space in the design world rather than trying to criticize how superficial design thinking is. This route might seem heavier and does make more sense, at least to me. I don't know what you think. I'm just, I'm just having like some kind of realization that maybe the combination of the two might create like a, a, a blind spot into something. Like I don't feel like the two are necessarily good at something, which is to assess whether what they are doing is necessarily like what they are, what is this supposed to bring as as a result. Like I, I don't feel like philosophy is especially good at that. Like because because we don't want to assess the like the reality of the idea. We want to assess how it stands against other ideas, right? Um, and and in design, I mean, we we tend to want to test it against what we think or we, what we discovered prior to that are the things that are important for users or stakeholders right but are we really testing for the underlying principles that we you know that we 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 put in the initial intent of, of the of the design proposal of the design choices that we we are making right i i, I mean because you were mentioning epistemology and this is where i always like feel like we we are good at at, at testing the, the byproduct of the ideas, right? So for instance, you, you create something out of design principles and philosophical ideas, and then you test the object that you created. But you can, you can only know how good is the object against reality. It doesn't say anything about the validity of the ideas that generated those, this, this object, right? And this is where I see, like, <laughs> 
uh, some kind of blind spots that we are not really necessarily good at doing those things uh, either in design or in philosophy, right? I, I mean, there are like, <clears throat> there is a note, like if you go back to a way back, <laughs> um, like, the, like if the Republic, right? So there is this notion that of virtue mm -hmm. that is, that is included in that. And therefore, if you, the suggestion was that the philosophers should run the city because the philosophers understood virtue, right? And that, and that they would be able to act without self-interest, sort of, right? In kind of a bottom, like really, I'm oversimplifying, I'm gonna butcher one of the, <laughs> the biggest, you know, philosophical documents, but in terms, in terms of it being useful, one of the things that's, that becomes clear in that is that he's talking about a realm of knowledge so that philosophers have a realm of knowledge, right? A domain of knowledge. And he also talks about like shoemakers having a domain of knowledge, right? They, they should understand the world of shoes, he says, right? So I think one of the things that we need to discuss is, well, what's that domain for designers? What is the mm -hmm. domain of knowledge for designers? And I think we should, I mean, I personally think we should stay away from design thinking as a, as a concept in this because it kind of, it is a shorthand and a, you know, a commodification of a bunch of other things that, that happen. And I don't think that we can remove what we're doing from the actual action, right? Because one of the things that we need to do is design, like you, um, like you said, it, it, there is an, an artifact that gets created that allows to achieve some kind of future right, some kind of future state that's preferable to the current state. And yes. one of the questions we have to ask at a deeper level is, is that future state virtuous, right? But it, it is in the making of the thing and the under, and that kind of, this almost actually brings back the Peter Principle stuff because there is a kind of a concept in place in terms of human advancement, but the system itself has a level of folly to it because it, it's kind of taken to its, it's when, it, when it reaches its end, it's already jumped the shark. Right, like by the time the person's in that position, they've gone, they've they've overreached, and so there's a detriment to the actual system itself. So inside that, there is this notion of, you know, designing, I don't know, uh, promotions, right? Like demo designing a system where people are able to rise up, where people are able to be motivated and and you know and work to something bigger, um, and that in and of itself seems virtuous. Except in the actual making of it, you see that there's an issue in that system. So we can only judge whether or not this, this thing is effective in the making of it, right? So yes. that's one of the things that, that's tricky about, about design. And that's why I think we have to, like, I, that's why I want to remove, like, design thinking from the conversation and just do it, call it design, because I think the making and the outcome is so important in the entire ethical thread from the conception of this more perfect future to the actual, you know, secondary effects that come out of this thing that originally seemed virtuous, that you can't critique until it becomes material. Yes. And, and, and to what you said, there's, there's an aspect that we can differentiate from sciences as well, yeah. Yeah. Where, where, where we want to, in science, we want to isolate cause and effect, and, and therefore we, we want to be able to draw a, a predictive model of what we, of what we see and what we observe. Which is not really the intent in design because it's it's more in that sense. Uh, I think we, we had like several times the discussion, Mark, but it's more probabilistic um, approach to to in that sense that if you may if you put like the same designers and you you know test them with the same goal to create the same kind of object in the end, they will do it several times, but the end result might be each time different, and 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 the type of outcomes that it will bring might be different as well and which is kind of desirable right because it builds yes. knowledge and it builds knowledge of and in the world in a different way that science does which is you know to observe a phenomenon and then prove that you understand the underlying cause right yes. like we talked to, i think yeah we talked about this like a science experiment is good is if you run it you know a thousand times and you get the same result every time that proves its validity whereas a design experiment um, ideally, you should get a thousand different results, and that should prove its validity. So they're different kind of ideas of kind of experimentation. Right? I'm, I'm not saying that design doesn't include 
the kind of like soft scientific social kind of, you know, like AB testing and you know that that kind of thing. That definitely is a part of it. But in the actual creative process, the iteration and kind of creative iteration actually should generate different results, right? Yeah. Or not. I think a good example would be, you know, kind of James Watt um, inventing the steam engine, right? Like he invented it without a theory of thermodynamics. Um, so in the absence of that, um, he just created an apparatus where the condensed uh, water from the steam was already pretty hot. And so he just basically used that condensed water to recycle it. And that's where the added efficiency came from that allowed the steam engine to actually be somewhat commercial. And, you know, through, through iterating uh, through several generations, you've got a, a product, right? And, um, and so, yeah, I mean, I agree. I, it's probably my fault to even bring up the, the <laughs> word design principle, but uh, I, I guess what I'm, what I was really trying to get at was that, you know, in the absence of leaving everything, you know, to the way it is, ceteris paribus, right? Um, that's, you know, some unacceptable if you see or en envision um, a different outcome. The problem is, um, even if you can envision it, but you don't have the necessary methodology to implement that vision, then it becomes um, one where you have to grasp for, for a lot of concepts that are outside your realm of expertise, outside your realm of, yeah, your experiences, right? And so you need the most abstract uh, types of experiences and inspiration in order to generate, you know, um, the next iterative cycle. Yeah. Damn, bitch, it's all. One minute. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, I, so I think there, there are those kind of two layers I'm of good. Like, there's the intentional outcome. Like, this is what I intended to happen. So that could be one thing where you can kind of criticize it, you know, is that good or not? And then is the efficiency of achieving that aim, which is the second level of is it good design, right? A, is the intention good? And B, does it, does it get you there? Right. This is one of the interesting things about uh, kind of like liberal democratic capitalist societies is that much of the design principles behind, uh, sorry, I used the word again, much of the, the theory behind it is that you can intended to do, right, with very minimal um, rules, you know, it's a very libertarian type of state. Um, yeah. You know, like you mentioned, uh, Adam Smith, it's just, you know, a bunch of specialists um, doing their specialist things. And that is what actually creates the wealth of nations, right? And uh, in addition to that, like, you know, if you leave democracy alone, um, you know, there are some ideas that then, you know, the principles of democracy, democracy, such as, you know, you have a large population. And so then you naturally you 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 would think that people would choose the most meritocratic um you know through through the democratic vote voting system and whatnot as long as it's not manipulated or whatnot right so that's with an asterisk but um but yeah, so the efficiency of these types of systems would be that they have this type of regenerative energy around them you can just kind of say what they are and then just let it happen and it happens naturally right and and it's like everybody is uh uh like like the operators or or, or the or the people who are in the system they they know the source code like they they behave like ants they know what you are saying um almost like uh intuitively and so they just they just obey and just they just do and incentives drive them
So um, I'm thinking about the, the fact that you mentioned intentionality as kind of the, the motivation of the designer. And it makes me wonder like how deep you need to dive into that intention when you create it, when you place it. Because I mean, one basic assumption that I can think of is that the world is not perfect. It's far from being perfect. And what we create is either filled with systemic discrimination and discrepancies and irregularities, and they're not actually serving those who truly need it. So the way we design systems uh, in general and you know products in general, if we don't understand those intentions behind them and how to follow them through through these different processes, I think we we actually overcomplicate. We end up in creating more problems than we're actually solving, or we end up in creating a solution for a problem that didn't exist, or you know, a lot of things in between. But I'm just thinking about you know going back to to philosophy is how do you ensure that design stays awake and questions the biases and questions the system and is able to do better or understand when it does does worse because i don't know <laughs> well I, I think there's a there's a i mean yes probably designers tend to see things through intentionality and this is for the good and the bad of the of that i mean i mean it, it works at a certain level but that but then you need to understand the extension to which it works like there's a limit to your own you know intentionality and the effect you can have through through it and um those blind spots you said yeah yeah and, and sometimes you just need to like you don't yet you don't know yet the effect of what your intent what what you tried will have and there, and then for, therefore that means you you need to wait for the environment to you know f like send send a signal a, a feedback right to to what happened uh, and that means you you don't know you know you should expect something but you don't know exactly what it is, and in that sense it's interesting because it means it means that not everything is intentional. So you know that there's a limit to to it. It's important to understand as as designers because when we see problems we always ask what why ne no one tried to fix it before, but the reality is like many tried to fix it before. But they tried it from different standpoints and perspectives with different, you know, like mediums and different tools and, you know, and, and, and yeah. And, and, and especially when we talk about like, like complex problems that are most of the time and, and, um, layered and intricated things that are not like an issue. It's not a problem it's a combination of things that are good and bad at the same time that creates the thing that we that we see and so it's it's a, sometimes like one of the tendencies to oversimplify the reality to make it fit our model of intentionality right which is uh, one of the of the drawback of of the of the approach but yeah, I don't know. At least if, you could say yeah. these products, you know, what you create, what you design begins to have its own autonomy, its own intention. Yeah. You may place one, but then it's sent out in the world and it does its own thing, depending yeah. on how it interacts with the different other it designs. Makes, it makes me think of, you know, the, the notion of a hyper object. Yes. The, uh, yeah, right. Yeah. So I wonder if there's a notion of a hyper problem, <laughs> you know. That goes that goes along with that, right? That is that is in and of itself so intertwined with other problems that it's kind of you know uh, just around. Since there's a good example, a recent and good and like pretty trendy discussion that exists that 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 display the same features as what just what we we, we just said is is Web three. I don't want to go into the details necessarily, but it's just to say that 
that many see it through a technical lens. Like it's a, it's a technical problem because it's a technical object that that brought this problem, right? And 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 you could argue against that that it's it's not because now it is intricated in our social tissue as well, and therefore it's not only that, right? And so it's it's another simplification to see the challenges of web of the web in general as only a technical issue, and. And to the point I was making before, it how do you assess the validity of the ideologies behind Web3 when actually what you are testing are the type of protocols and, te- and rules you are implementing into a technical system that has no mechanism to test for the type of social impacts it should have, right? So it, it, it's... It's exactly the same kind of thing. It's just that it's engineers that are making the same <laughs> this issue. But I have a good example just to uh, to change a bit of, of the subject. But I follow a guy on on YouTube who created um, a marble machine, and this guy is named uh, well the the the, um, the guy the guy is na- the the channel name is uh, Wintergarten, and he's Swedish, yeah. I guess. And I, I really enjoyed watching his first video. So the guy created a, a marble machine, so a, a machine in, in made in plywood, plywood that you know um, take marble and just drop them on instruments and making like a melody. And it's 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 really like a big machine and it's really complicated. And I follow him like for for several years. And he did the first one. It has so many, so, uh, such, a, such a huge success in the internet that he he tried to redesign it from the, the start go, like from the ground up, like to to make a new one, like in a better way. Like the first one was more like a prototype, and to iterate on it and make a a, a perfect machine. And he went into the rabbit hole of engineering, and. He, his artistic mind like went into conflict with with the type of rigor and the type of constraints that engineering thinking puts upon designing an object right and i think it's a good example of you know the type of like paradoxical mindset you should have like in when you think about design in general um, I, I don't know if any one of you can relate to to that uh, uh, channel, but if you don't know, just look at the Mar- Marble Machine X on on YouTube, and and you, you find like a lot of video about his design process um, and his struggles. <laughs> but yeah. No. Also, here's a question for creativity Diana. and. Oh, sorry, go ahead. What go ahead. Creativity go ahead. is. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, did you hear what I said or not? Can you repeat it? Yeah, I was, I was just saying that that brings us back to the topic that Diana read, which is that of creativity and how, how does creativity play a role in, in design and what is creativity? And I mean, I wonder if anyone has more insight into how or sources philosophical sources that are discussing creativity i mean you hardly see a joint course on philosophy and creativity <laughs> as often as, you know, you see it tied to design, which is, you know, heartbreaking. But I mean, with creativity, it comes from a different standpoint. It's just the fact that it doesn't have a an acquired discipline that you can associate it with in, in education. And also, you wouldn't even know how to, to standardize it. With, but, I mean, it would be the death of creativity. <laughs> But th- there's something like creative problem uh, solving um, communities. It exists for like the, the early 30s, something like that. And they they have tried to to like 
put some, like describe some conditions for creativity to happen and narrow it down to some kind of process with like a lot of variation, weak. but yeah. Isn't it too weak to call it a discipline? Creativity is more no, like a mode so. of maybe doing things or, you know, correlating to the environment and meeting certain criteria, something around your individual upbringing, whether it's something fixed. It's actually hard to map it. But maybe this could be the blind spot that you kind of hinted at between philosophy and design. You have this blind spot, which is creativity and which is, you know, the, the way to extract what you need from philosophy and take into design and maybe, you know, kind of do the vice versa. But I think uh, ultimately is to find a common purpose for philosophy to, and design to, to be together. And before we had this discussion, it made me think like, what is the baby, <laughs> you know, the philosoph philosophy and design baby. And I thought that it's actually, it's, I don't know if I should call it like this, but it's more like a form of design wisdom, which you want maybe is along those lines. If you want to become a better designer and consolidate some of your uh, abilities and skills, I think having that design wisdom is something you, you might want to to aim at and with philosophy with love of wisdom <laughs> it would be nice there are there are some kind of philosophical i guess positioning statements that talk about creativity as recombination like there is that right where so you yeah. have some like a, i've got a quote here i was working on something yesterday but like uh, Sch schrodinger um uh, famous for the cat you know, is and is not dead. Um, so the task is not so much to see what no one has yet seen, but to think what nobody has yet thought about that which everybody sees. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about creativity as um, like recombination um, and building off of and, and even um, the David Lynch, the director of many kind of bizarre things from Eraserhead to Lost Highway <laughs> to whatever. Who, challenge the notion of causality <laughs> in narrative um, also has a theory about um, well he's, he's quite into transcendental meditation and, and that's where he finds his kind of where he becomes in touch with things but his theory is that ideas are caught yes. that, they, um, that it's that it's impossible to to pinpoint the beginning of an idea that is a that is a moment in a stream of something that you happen to catch, but it's built on the shoulders of everything that's ever happened mm -hmm. um, and you kind of step into it. And so there are those, those kinds of approaches to trying to position creativity as types of activities. Yes. Yes. I think in nature, there's something that's, that is close to creativity and recombination, which is called exaptation. And this is when like the something that uh, an organism developed a feature to for a specific purpose, and by accident, the feature is used for another thing that was not the initial intent, and and it's a creative way to reuse some characteristics of like some some species, and like like the, the best example is. Uh, what's it called? Like with the, um, um, uh, my English is just escaping <laughs> my, my mind right now. What's so the, 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 um, the plume, the, um, when the, feathers. yeah, feathers. feathers. Thank you. So the, the, the feathers was most likely developed for, um, a display and, uh, sexual, uh, parades and stuff like that. And by accident, it allowed the animals to to fly, and uh, pr potentially to escape like uh, predators. And this is how the feature was recombined in a new in a new way. And we call we could call that a form of creativity, an accidental one, but it's a form of creativity in that sense. Just... Like improvisation. <laughs> <laughs> saying that evolution is not so like in the hand of a creator that designed everything and everything is determined but it's actually more uh, responsive to the environment 
and improvised, which would make sense. A lot of things about us as a species and nature in general don't always make sense and are tied into this unified uh, yeah, understanding that it's supposed to be there because it was planned from the initial mm. uh, development. I, I'm almost imagining like a far side cartoon where the featherless turkey goes up to the other bird. You know, hey man, nice feathers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but so, but my, my question for Diana is, is this, is in what we've talked about today, there's been you know, points to political theory, points to philosophy, points to kind of <clears throat> treatises that are more like just understanding or knowledge based. Like, where is the line drawn? <clears throat> like, is Adam Smith, is that philosophy? You know, are other books that are written about, you know, economics, for example, do they fall into that? If political theory, for example, I mean, there's a whole realm of knowledge that we that we dig into. I mean, like there's Gestalt theory in mm -hmm. how it is that you set up, um, you know, a uh, an interface or a poster or something like that. Like it feels like there are a lot of fuzzy edges to some of these concepts, right? So I, this, I don't have a, I don't have an answer at all. That's a question about how do we deal with that, right? Yes, that's true. Uh, while you were talking, I could map a lot of from, uh, yeah, ethics to phenomenology and mm -hmm. information theory. So you, you know, these contents, I think philosophy has always had this battle of contents and trying to, I think the work of a philosopher has always been to try and navigate the contents and still stay on flow to things to understand that, if, you know, eventually nothing really is the right way the, the the idea trying to get a universal theory of something a universal philosophy is not sustainable and not really useful and i think the more we evolve even culturally maybe 200 years ago we would have been very deontological and there's only one way to be but now with this continental philosophy the fact that we've seen how design can create the world itself uh, it gives us these possibilities to explore. So when it comes to these blurred boundaries, rather than trying to set boundaries and see where does philosophy begin and other fields end, to try and just find the building blocks of attitudes and beliefs, to actually think more about how we establish these limits, to, to go into the, the bones of these uh, structures, I think, because I mean, I am not a philosopher. I studied philosophy, but I can't call myself a philosopher. I can't say that I've read entire books and treaties because I just don't have the patience and the attention deficit really takes a toll. So what I was interested in is to actually be able to bring that awareness to understand that I might not have that knowledge and my ignorance, you know, might be a problem, but being able to question and try and keep this mind open and think about how can I improve designs and, you know, just, just put myself in that intention space where I don't want to create a perfect design. I just want to make it work and I just want to make room for it so it can improve either by the hand of another designer or by my hand or by itself. So as long as we think about solving problems in a way that we don't create more problems, maybe that philosophy shouldn't polarize with another ideology. You know, like we mentioned a few weeks ago, uh, the difference between an ideology, uh, like a, yeah, like a philosophy and philosophies, you know, to, to try and count philosophies. And I think, I don't even know where we will be heading with, with this discussion, how it will evolve uh, now that we kind of got into it. But I think navigation, learning to have a navigation system into all these things, would be crucial. And I think that starts with beliefs, understanding beliefs, understanding assumptions, and understanding how people take positions in different stance, in different philosophies, even though you may not understand or even know what that philosophy is called. So just having that awareness might be a beginning. I think Matt had wanted to say something. Yeah, go on. 
We don't hear you. I don't hear you, Matt. I don't know if the others hear you or not. No, you're... I think the, the internet is... We don't hear you. <laughs> uh. <laughs> okay, well, wh while he's, uh, he's away, I just wanted to say that I find philosophy of just a too broad a topic and and I was actually curious if we could you know play a little game and uh, list maybe some more specific topics and say which ones and everyone could vote on which which fields they find are most important maybe we can do that later uh, let um, I'll let Matt ask his question do it Trevor No, still bad. Just look it's at the working. at the right hand corner of your screen. You have a settings wheel. You click on that, and you should have some options for your mic. So at the bottom right, you have a settings wheel. If you click on that, it should pop uh, opens a, a pop up where you you have some options. Check if it's the right uh, input. Right. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, so one, one thing about creativity that, um, that I find from primary sources is, is that philosophers are really good at discovering the types of dark patterns of human um, behavior. So like, for instance, or, or human thought, thought uh, ways. So like, for instance, like, uh, uh, the Hegelian dialectic is one of those, right? Another one is actually, you know, just kind of like, kind of art inspired, but also like, basically also from Ben and Burke. And, um, and I'm, Kant even mentioned a little bit about this in his aesthetics about uh, the difference between beauty and sublimity. So beauty is the abundance of pleasure, and, um, and sublimity is kind of like the, you know, uh, the taking away of pain. So it's kind of like this negative space of pleasure at the same time. So discovering these types of dark patterns um, kind of helps inform you about how, uh, how how information kind of flows in your mind. So the way like I think cognitive scientists think about how our neurons work is that it's analog input in and digital output out, right? So whether whether or not it fires or not, it, you know, that's a digital, and uh, the, the amount of, of, you know, other neurons that are connected to it, that, um, that you know, it, whether those connected neurons are or not, they attribute it to, you know, what kind of voltage difference, uh, and that, that's your analog input, right? And to, to date, I don't think that we have discovered a type of, even a mathematical way of, you know, describing this. So we create artificial networks of like weights and stuff to try to create, you know, artificial neural networks. Uh, and, and this is this is our AI, you know, attempt. This is our minimum viable product, right? Our MVP. Um, and um, so I think about creativity and to bring it back to what Kevin mentioned about um, that you need this kind of inefficiency of this evolutionary inefficiency of feathers in order to have... Um, Kind of an out uh, an outsized pr production of 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 outcomes, right? right? So I, I wrote on the chat um, the Kelly criterion, which is f equals um, p the probability minus you know the reverse the inverse probability divided by uh, the r, which is the, uh, the 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 rate of return or the outsized you know betting odds. So Kelly criterion is one way of how to um, it, it calculates F, which is supposed to be the fraction or, you know, the, the percentage of your maximum bankroll of kind of what to invest in. So it, it, you can imagine, like, this is basically just the formula that venture capitalists use, right? Um, they just put, like, 1% of their uh, fund into all these little small venture 
uh, ideas. No, they don't expect any of them to actually work, but one of them does, and that's that's where the returns are. And um, you know, in in many ways, creativity is basically extreme risk taking. But the the upside is so high. Like you know, you, you have to think about in terms of the fact that we've all seen birds. Uh, humans have seen birds for over you know many many millennia, but it wasn't until well, like a hundred and twenty years ago that uh, we were actually able to fly with you know the Wright brothers experimenting and, and so on and so forth. And so you know you you kind of require this type of Kelly criterion investment uh, strategy in a way in order to get progression in order to like move beyond your local maximum of efficiency and uh, and, and move, on, move downwards through this inefficiency valley and into uh, a, a, local, a global maximum, right? And I think that's, that's the idea behind creativity is to kind of tell that story. We lost uh, Matt, I guess. Oh, is it just me? One little thing we could do, like in terms of, you know, if you had to choose one uh, subfield of philosophy uh, as being the most relevant for design, which one would it be? I, I mean, maybe it's, it's a bit boring, but I thought that could be interesting. I just wanted to, so, you know, Ryan Singer from former Basecamp, he, he wrote this. They're, I mean, they're very, uh, they're pushing for this idea of bets very much. So, so this idea of betting on different types of solutions. And so you'll, you'll make a kind of gamble. And, and what I wanted to say also is that I think part of the confusion, and I hope Kevin will, will be in agreement with, him, with me here, is that I, I get the feeling we're always looking for a silver bullet, you know. And I think there are different regimes and in which... You, you have to have different modes of thinking and, 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 and an important part of the of the task is to identify in which regime you are uh, and adopt the right mode of thinking for the, for the right regime so for instance if you're talking about investment for me i mean so this um kelly criterion you're choosing it's 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 typical you know old school uh, decision theory where you're you're looking at bets okay so you're you, you have a choice, you know, prospect theory, all these guys, it's all the same kind of thing. So you, you, you have a few options and you have to choose between options. Essentially, that's what it is. And what we're not talking about is creating new options, you know, the unknown unknowns. And, and, and so this requires a different way of looking at the things. I, I don't know exactly what kind of way. I think exact exaptation is, is very interesting, although... I'm having a kind of I'm following these guys on on LinkedIn, which are really talking about this a lot, and I, I find it very a very stimulating idea. Although I I don't think the pure exaptation as is um, 
as it happens in evolutionary theory is 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 enough because we are thinking beings we can model the world and i think uh, acceptation in its pure form doesn't accommodate for that uh, it as i've seen it explained but anyway well, those were my ideas yeah can you just i'm not familiar with this with exactation exaptation as in adaptation I'll let Kevin explain. exaptation Okay. So, okay, I think it's. Yeah. I mean, yeah, this is what I explained earlier with this uh, feather uh, that was developed for something, and that was accidentally reused for another thing. I think the one that we discovered recently about uh, humans is um, um, uh, some kind of uh, mechanism uh, process in our in our brain. Is it for the the grammar and the fingers? Yes. The ability to move your fingers very tied to your linguistic yes. structure for processing grammar. Yes. So that's that's an interesting one. Yeah, and and this is uh, where where it's interesting. It's 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 a co evolution with the environment, and it, it has to be. It, I mean, it it has to be uh, clearly defined that it's not something that happens because of the feature. But because of the relationship between the feature, the, all the features of the organism and the type of feedback mechanism that exists with the environment. So it's a co-evolution process in creativity and our own autonomy of being able to create things. Where is different, what is different is, um, is, is exactly that, that we, we are intentionally creating something, but then exaptation happens only in a serendipitous way. Where, where you don't expect something to happen from what you intended to do. Like in the sense where someone use, like, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, um, uh, it's a simplified example. So it has some, some problem in, in itself. But if you take a knife and you use it to, uh, you know, um, uh, um, tighten up um, um, a screw, for instance, with it, then it's an ex in a sense it's an acceptation of the of the of the tool which was not originally meant meant for for doing that but but you find a new way to use it now it's not an acceptation really because because not everyone is using knife to do it right so it's not something that that is you know massively used now but it's just to give an example of some kind of things that was not expected in design we have a concept that is really close we call it a adoption basically and uh, appropriation. So once you had you adopted some kind of product and you you know how it can how it is uh, the shape of it and some kind of its feature, you can find new ways to use it, right? And and we can we call that uh, appropriation, which is co really closed in the idea, but not exactly the the same thing. So what I described before was more uh, an appropriation than acceptation, but it's I mean you you get the you get the point, right? Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. I mean, so, so you get this nuanced thinking that comes with, uh, you know, an idea like acceptation. It makes me think like, would people back in the days when they didn't have the philosophical trends to, to, to help them think this way, would they still uh, acknowledge acceptation or they would just be very hung up on what Darwin said and formulated as a theory of evolution, very kind of intricately disconnected from the the environment because now we have this capacity to to perceive it as such but maybe you know uh, all these ideas all these creative applications have an effect on our ideas and how you know the what you're saying mark about the fact that ideas are caught it kind of it it, it goes into this information theory that is kind of the, the, the bio field of ideas that kind of surround us and they are constantly developing as we develop and we discuss and create something so you know maybe a vague so, answer to the the first struggle that you pointed out with philosophy and boundaries is to actually develop nuanced thinking and to become more aware of how to become to, to develop this as a nuanced thinking and i guess the other question too is is the goal of this uh for lack of a better term instrumental right is is it that we are looking to these ideas in order to deploy them or to use them to help us, you know, act. 
Isn't right. that just half of the equation? Because, <laughs> you know, Kevin, Kevin you said you, we need to create, and Jonathan, we need to create something new. We realize that there are so many limits to, to what's going on actually right now. So we need to kind of reinvent a little. Maybe that's what we're going through, a reinvention. Yeah. But, but also, like, if I look at, in architecture, the... I don't want to say the most heavy handed, but definitely the most direct um, link between kind of French post-structural thinking and the built environment is something like Parc La Villette in, in Paris, right? Where it's uh, Derrida meets Bernard Chumi, basically, right? Where Chumi was working through, you know, the kind of ideas of deconstruction, ideas of scale and that, and then actually built something that happened at a scale that was completely different than the human scale. The human scale was an afterthought to this game that happened in an abstract manner that had to do with a kind of a, like a top level critique of a way of put, putting things together, right? And so it was, it was built. So there was a direct relationship between thinking and writing on the one hand in a philosophical terms and translating that into some kind of built form, right? There were, so there's this, kind of direct relationship between philosophical inquiry and, and built work, right? A thing that is made. And yeah. so there's probably a, there's a continuum there in terms of the tightness of that relationship. And I think that, that that's a kind of an interesting thing to look at. Like what, in terms of the instrumentality of the ideas, how direct do they influence the thing that you make, right? Mm -hmm. and, and not just formally, but kind of, or, or rather in a larger conception of form, form also being the way that it might move people or the way that it might move culture. Like these things have a form, even if it's not like the kind of reductive material form that there's, there's a form in a larger sense to the effect that this thing has. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that remains to be explored. Yeah. <laughs> On that jump, I wanna, I wanna leave, and I wanna leave you if you wanna keep the conversation going. But I think we we need to kind of, we will need at least one more conversation to, yes. to kind of see where we're where we wanna go. And like you said, where is this instrumentality located, <laughs> if that's possible? But uh, yeah, it was really nice having this conversation with you guys. I'm going to leave you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Diana. Bye. See you next time. Bye. Yeah. So, Mark, I think about your inquiry about instrumentality, <clears throat> uh, the, the thinker, and it kind of goes back to the session of ethics again, is that the, the thinker of the thought uh, actually bears a very huge burden and into the outcome of that, of the utility of that instrumentality, right? Of, of the idea. So, um, you know, the, the, the idea itself um, to, to one person, you know, that, 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 that person married with that idea might not be enough to take it to the finish. You need to hand over the baton to maybe another writer, maybe to another runner. And, um, and I think that uh, that requires a little bit more than just, um, you know, the, the, the virality of the idea, but also just the, 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 you know, the spending cultural and uh, cultural power of, the, of yeah. the, you know, origin of the idea and, and whatnot. And this kind of goes back to how, um, you know, culture has a particular type of context that allows you to overcome um, certain certain limits of information um, uh, limit theory limits, right? Like for instance, um, you have to have some kind of redundancy in language. Right? You have to have these types of grammatical structures, even though the grammatical structures kind of um, create, you know, creates these redundancies. It creates these types of speed bumps, right? But um, the culture allows you to 
uh, transmit information that uh, kind of bypasses um, certain things like, you know, if, if you say certain cultural contexts, like, you know, if you give a mouse a cookie, then you know what's going to happen next, right? It's going to ask for some milk. Um, so these are examples of like how few shot learning um, kind of work is that you, 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 can, you can mimic the context in a way that, um, that gives you more information than what the data uh, uh, it is out there. So you can get kind of yeah. like, yeah. This is the paradox of the, in the information theory, right? It's like, it appears that there's more information that what is, that is out there, right? Because you can, you can derive more information out of something that exists as data than just the data itself. So it's, it's like with DNA and, and stuff like that, that there's something more to it than just the information itself. Like some information exists on top of yeah. that, 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 that is in a, in a tacit way it exists, but not in a formal way, right? Yeah. So it, it, I think I think information theory kind of says that with limited amount of data, you could get more, but it's just a question of how. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, m most of information theory is, makes this assumption, right? Like it's, it's, it's a very physics assumption that um, there isn't something called like, you know, cultural context or history context that we can draw on as a common culture, right? Um, but we can with philosophy in, in a way, you know, the, the, the Western uh, philosophical tradition, we can draw upon that culture as like a branch of knowledge. And that's how it, instead of having a memoryless um, system of a memory system, and that gives you an extra superpower of having limited data and still getting more information than you otherwise deserve, right? That's a, a, an interpretation power. That 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 you have yeah. only if you you instance, you know what is the context, right? For instance, if you're given any kind of data, you need to apply very rigorous system to thinking. You know, like Daniel Kahneman, Daniel Kahneman style system two thinking, where you have to think very deeply, more than yes. thirty minutes, looking at the data, doing the math and stuff, and then figuring out the relationships. Right? The system one is intuition, so you can learn the intuitive parts of all the hard stuff, um, you know, based off of like all the equations that people in the past have done. So you, you gain system one um, of, of other people's system two. You know. Yeah. But I, I would say it, it requires for the ideas. So th there's an interesting um, discussion we, we I had with, with, with another community, which is more on the, on the realm of uh, complexity sciences and stuff like that. And they, they were, we were discussing about the fact that um, we can apply evolutionary uh, theory to uh, to ideas themselves, that there's a co-relationship, like there's a co-evolution of the idea and the context. And uh, this is what makes some ideas more efficient to, 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 to spread and, and sometimes more efficient to be applied as well. So some ideas are just good at spreading, but not at uh, necessarily at becoming some kind of, of reality outside of the, the fact that they exist and then people talk about it, but that, that's just it, right? Uh, but, but there's something interesting there as well. It's like you, um, if we talk about contextuality, that means some ideas have affordance to become real. You know, they, they have some features that makes them easier to be transposed into something else than just the idea itself, right? So it's 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 where I think it's what Marx suggested as well with with this idea is that we some ideas might might be more suited to be transposed into something else, right? And in philosophy, there's some kind of work that is interesting, which is the the work of metaphors that that helps. It creates like it's porous as a as a subject, so anything can fit in it. Like you can transpose the metaphor into so many places that apparently it makes it like meaningless. But this this is the opposite. It's it's meaningful because it it can be transposed to many places. 
and in different ways and and then leads to different ideas that can be transformed into something more concrete right and and this is where this is where there's something like th that is specific to metaphors in terms of features and and coevolution power in that sense yeah i think i think you're talking about internet memes in a sense right like something that's essentially meaningless but then it has some depth into it once you um, once you create that that <laughs> possibility of experiencing tremendous amounts of negative state right? if you put something so stupid that um you know for for a person who has high intellect sees it differently right that's the phenomenology of this type of this object and the recipient um playing into this instrumentality. So, you know, it goes back to like what Mark's saying is that the idea itself, the object, uh, has a completely different property than the actual phenomenon uh, that you're trying to create as the, as the phenomenon being experienced, right? Experience is, is the phenomenon, not necessarily, you know, a, a, a core property of the object or the idea itself. But you know that actually is, uh, brings up a significant point too about um, why why people or why it's actually very important to use virality just for the sake of that particular property itself. The the, the, the virality, and then you can you can transmit messages through that using that right. Um, that this. This might be the, the true inst instrumentality of uh, of internet culture is that we can now bifurcate uh, uh, every single type of uh, event, right? Or you know, any any kind of marketing campaign, anything that's put out there, there can be a judgment about what it is, what it's what its primary. Yeah. Yeah, it, it 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 adds something like to the disposability of the context. Like it it prepare people to like what is interesting when you apply virality to like organizations and how how change up happen in organizations is like if if you make the idea of a change viral, then you you create the disposition for the change to really happen in the context of the organization, right? And so you, we talked about alignment and, and recombination, and uh, in, in complexity, there's this, this notion of, um, of um, dispos dispositionalities of the context, um, and th this idea that you, you, there's some forces that constrain the way things happen in certain in certain contexts, and 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 you you increases the chance that something will be more accepted as a change if you if the prior to the change the idea of the change was became viral right yeah I don't know Jonathan you wanted to say something can you hear me yes okay well, I mean, it's it's kind of the moment has passed a bit now, but I, I was wondering if you were using uh, if you the the ways you were using the word context was the same for both of you because what I understood is Matt it, talking about culture as context was more in the sense of of uh, representations or mental. current state of the environment so I, I don't know if you were you were kind of talking at you know uh, you know uh, not a, the same but you're not using the same definition I got the feeling but I don't know you, you may be right <laughs> well um, mental models uh, I would have said there's a lot of um, uh, mental models also have a lot of hairs, like they're very hairy in, in a sense. And I, I would call the hairs on the mental models, the context, right? They can be very, very furry. 
uh, creatures. Yeah, that's <laughs> that, that's my metaphor. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, you. I'm curious. I'm curious about this metaphor. <laughs> mental, <laughs> mental, mental models are furry. Yeah, they're furry. Like for instance, um, when you when you read a very very heavy and dense philosophical text like the Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant, right? Um, you 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 read it for what it is. That's that's the model. That's the mental model. But your mind also wanders around thinking about like how it applies to like you know your everyday life blah, blah, blah. that's the fur right that's like you know just the that's the woolly mammoth right that's in a sense like the critique of your reason is you know it's skeleton it's muscles it's, it's flesh and whatever but it, what you really see is the hair and um and and that hair applied to you know what Kant was trying to solve which was like trying to synthesize you know uh French rationalism and British empiricism that's that's the woolly mammoth hair, right? That that you experience. I, at least that's what I experience, right? That's just my metaphor. And so many of these other, you know, ideas and then the models by you know philosophers and, and people um, have have these types of hairs, right? And, and I think that's actually really the cool thing about um, going back to primary sources and reading them for yourself is you can bring your own uh, present day modernity uh, in, in into their you know lens and experience the hair for yourself. <laughs> so, what's the most important subfield of philosophy for design? <laughs> Straight to the point. <laughs> well, so so here's here's a question: Is decision theory a philosophy? No. Right. I think everything is a philosophy in the end. I mean, if you that's I mean, well, that, that's what I was worried about. That's what I was kind of getting at with, with Diana. Yeah, that was the that was the the trap that I saw <laughs> on the floor as we were. <laughs> you know, more metaphors. Well, uh, well, if you if you if you take fine. philosophy for what it was at the beginning, it was just questioning knowledge, right? Yeah. And 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 therefore, yes, everything fits in philosophy, and many currents, like many um, uh, ideas, became like their own field. But at yeah. the beginning, it was just you know questioning what people believed and yeah. what we believed of what we believed right so I mean, my, my view is is it's a practice it's it's i mean nowadays it's it's as you say i mean it started i mean science was part of philosophy and 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 then as these things get you know people get more and more involved in the different subfields then they branch off and and i think i mean it's it's more about the the what's the i can't quite find the right terminology it's the it's the mechanism it's the it's the protocol the the uh, the method is the method that is used that i think is is probably a better way to separate philosophy say from science or design yeah. and uh, so I, I mean science has uh, you know scientific method quote unquote and philosophy has a different way of understanding and approaching the world. I mean, that's how I would go about it. Well, and, and for many things, we can distinguish the practice and the field of knowledge that it relates to, right? So it's like in design, there's, a, there's the theories and, and the knowledge uh, that exists behind the term design and the discipline of design. Uh, and and you have the practices that exist within the, that that realm and and yeah and I, I think it goes the same with with philosophy so maybe one useful distinction is is either it, are we talking about the philosophy as a practice or as the as the field that it relates to right well personally I'm more interested in the in the field it relates to I would say but then I think that's of course. Uh, mm. Personal. Well, uh, of course, you cannot really like separate the the 
the two be like totally right it's a the, the practice comes with the <laughs> with it in that sense that but what are we most interested in is what you yeah what you said i mean yeah. if i mean and this this runs into a problem in that it doesn't separate itself from science enough but if this notion of philosophy is an inquiry into the world we live in right into and about the world we live in and this is why mm. i asked about the instrumentality of it I have no plans on becoming a philosopher. I'm a designer and therefore I look for ways that mental models, furry or shaved, feathered or not, um, <laughs> help me work, right? Help me make decisions, help, help me improve the outcomes that I'm, that I'm looking for, right? So that, that my interest in it is, is like I say, is, is instrumental. Yes. Right? Because I think about it and, and I think about design in a very material way. Right. Like, and I don't mean that just product design, but that, that when you do organizational design or service design or something like that, there's a material effect on the world. Right. Yeah. Um, and that, and that that materiality is important to me to understand what the impacts of that material change are. Right. And so, so, yes. so I mean, I've, I've a pretty solid, like at that point it becomes useful, right. It becomes an instrument that I can deploy and, and I can, it allows me to frame and reframe, you know, but, apply multiple mental models. But, uh, we, yeah. we mustn't we mustn't get confused here because, of course, the so the let's say philosophical method, if that even exists, is mm -hmm. of course instrumental in uh, creating philosophical knowledge. But then the philosophical knowledge itself is instrumental in you using it for you know uh, designing and doing other things so that has and and you can and you can maybe you not, can go maybe, oh sorry go ahead. Oh, go ahead i was gonna say maybe not directly but in terms of understanding the world in which i'm acting yes right so not like a this method of inquiry allows me to do better user research but more <laughs> i have a bit like in reading, in, in doing something like very, very simply reading Foucault or something like that has made me more aware of power structures and understanding in the way that knowledge is created by the victors. You know, um, that to me is very useful when it comes to understanding the world that I work in. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And so that, that's that's an example of philosophy being useful in elucidating human nature or the nature of organizations or the nature of power or the nature of the things that are, oh, and also the other thing that it's really done is it's, it's, it has revealed the world as being far more artificial than I would have thought without that kind of inquiry, right? That things are much more made by human than we give credit for, I think naturally, right? Because <laughs> some of these things have been, you know, um, it's naturalized, like the right word. They've, they've been they've been talked of as being natural effects, like the markets, right? Yes. Or things like that. And in fact, they're not. In fact, they're 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 there are things that we ascribe a natural order to that are in fact artificial. And somebody like Foucault is great at you know making that obvious, right? Yes. So. But, yes, yeah, I agree. And uh, this is where you can draw, like clearly, you can draw uh, uh, practice from knowledge. But I, I mean, it's not specific to to philosophy. Uh, I, I would mm -hmm. say. Now the question is: um, Is it useful only for the individual, mm -hmm. or is it useful for a collective understanding of what is the world? And I would say there's a collective aspect to design that is, that goes beyond the designer itself. Like the, the, the designer is a, a vehicle for 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 knowledge in a sense, where where you you go to to try to understand things, then then you know design something from that, right? So we are a vehicle of knowledge, but then we are also influencers of knowledge because we bring new perspectives about things. And in that sense, there's a collective relationship with, with what we are trying to do as, as, as designers, right? And I wonder how far it goes in that direction as well, mm -hmm. you know? Yes. Uh, yeah. 
I, I wanted to ask Matt uh, something because we're talking, touching upon the utility of knowledge. You, you brought up this uh, notion of information, Shannon information. Uh, would, would you distinguish the notion of knowledge yeah. and information and how would you distinguish that? Distinguishing knowledge and information. Um, yeah, I would say that, um, okay, so what information is, uh, is it comes from entropy, right? So it would be um, the, the entropy of information, for instance, uh, arises when there is a conflict and there is a right or wrong determination, right? But it's not necessarily binary, you know, yes or no. It could be one out of many, right, of possibilities. So, you know, like a multiple choice answer or something like that, you're, you're right or wrong, right? Um, because if you're always right, you don't actually gain any information. You're just like either really lucky, right? If you're always right, you're always either, either very lucky or you, you know, the system so well that you've, you've, you're at perfection level, so you don't learn anything, right? Uh, information is gained when you reach certain uh, limits, like, you know, when you're wrong, when you're proven wrong, and uh, as long as you're not catastrophically wrong, right, in a betting scenario, like, you know, Kelly Criterion also came from Bell Labs along with Paul Shannon, you know, and Kel and Color Criterion co um, co created, you know, around that same time uh, with the uh, information theory. But it's all just really about um, rational reasoning, or, or rational, um, yeah, uh, essentially rational reasoning. Um, how information relates to knowledge that actually comes down not to what information theory says, right? Information theory is just talks about what can be gained from chaos, conflict, yes or no, wrong or right terminations. Knowledge comes from your system. And I, I, I don't know, it's very subjective in some sense, what's useful for you, right? Economically, or aesthetically, like, for instance, if there is a particular type of book that you just love to read, and you gain information, and it doesn't provide you any kind of, you know, promotion value or any kind of like knowledge for your career progression, that's, that's fine. But, and, and you carry that aesthetic lineage on, right, in your, in your own mind. And that's, that's where information becomes kind of this aesthetic work, artistic knowledge, right, that you can pass on to, uh, you know, your, as, as your part of your legacy. But, so I think this information to knowledge is a, is a different cost function. Right, we're the, from data to information. That's that's one layer where we can kind of describe very quantitatively and mathematically. And this is the information age of how to turn data into information. But then making information into type this type of useful knowledge or unuseful but valuable knowledge is a different is a different category. And, and I I would say though that um, sometimes this type of artistic knowledge can be very, very useful um, in, in an acceptation type of way. Like for instance, if you kind of know a little bit of philosophy and you're a designer and then your client is like this kind of billionaire art collector and then you just talk something about like art and like impressionism and stuff like that, you build a connection, right? With your client and you win the contract. So, I mean, there you never know how these things might play. And it's it's up to you to build kind of like a repertoire if you want, want to, you know, move in this type of professional like development type of way, right? I mean, that's it. That's interesting. Um, oh, sorry, Kevin, you waving? Yeah, yeah, but you go yeah. ahead. I, I just I would just give my I, I would just give what I, I think is my definition of or at least distinction between information and and knowledge. But 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 go ahead, Mark. No, 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 I was I, I was going to say quickly that there's that I think there are those things which are 
generally useful in that like you understand philosophy and it makes you a good citizen and an interesting person versus the things that are specific to making you a good designer right that there's going to be some kind of line there that says well yes of course if you're a good designer you should be a good citizen and therefore you should you know be able to chat up rich people at parties um <laughs> which but i would say that there's a universal applicability <laughs> to that skill <laughs> um and a great one it's a, it's a it's a good point i just want to point out that it's like some of this are, are aspects of of all humans and some of it is specific to design and definitely it's a venn diet it's a subset right yeah sorry go ahead go ahead yeah i just wanted to say like to, to me knowledge is a, a way to structure information so it's reusable in a certain way and so to me it's the only it's the way i would i wouldn't you know like it, knowledge is um an arrangement of information that's that remains and that can use for other things and that would be the distinction i would make between information just information and and knowledge because Because there's an aspect to knowledge, which is whether we decide our autonomy to decide when it's useful. Whereas information is what comes to be useful at us at a certain time, right? And it's it's a bit different in that sense. Like there's there's an immediacy of and in contextual immediacy to information, whereas knowledge is something that is stored somewhere, but then we decide to use it at this certain point of time because we decided that it was useful to use it at this certain point in time. So um, this is, yeah, it can be individualistic, like it can be your knowledge, the way you build knowledge, but it can be also, you know, as, as all knowledge uh, in the academic world exists um, uh, as well. So it, it can be co-constructed and co-designed co in that sense. Right. That's yeah. Yeah, I think knowledge knowledge where it can be extremely customized. Because in my so I, I think that it's kind of like a funnel, right? Like a kind of like a tornado. That at the top of the tornado, you know, that's the data and it, it all funnels down to information. But then like um, you know, and information is is a very fundamental unit um but, but then the question is you know that's you know revenue is information right you know dollar amounts there that's information but th there's a there's a art form of what you, what you do what you reinvest the money you know back into right like, do you reinvest back into like uh retention um campaigns or do you reinvest back into you know like more data collection Or do you reinvest yes. into referrals, right? Yeah. How do you do it? That's you know knowledge choice. How you use it? Yes. Okay. In the same example, information is if we monitor how the sun behaves, right? It's information, but the knowledge is to know whether this is a cyclic uh, type of uh, behavior and what can we make out of that information that is more useful than just the information itself and how it is useful in, you know like over time like the, the fact that we know certain things now will potentially help us do something new or different in the future that we don't know about right now right so there's some kind of aspect to it that is uh, i think we touch again about transposability and applicability <laughs> yet again but <laughs> I would actually say that the data is knowing, you know, where the sun is, but it's information that that's actually the bigger hierarchy of, uh, of you know, basically the the heliocentric, you know, model, right, of the Earth being around mm -hmm. the sun and whatnot. And then knowledge would be the application, you know, do you for better agricultural production, right, or do you use it for, you know, like better solar output? based upon like finding out, you know, the right, like, the best places to put, you know, a solar farm and stuff like that. Um, you know, that's that's where it, it becomes, you know, much more, it requires an initiative, right? An initiative comes in part, part with knowledge. So 
So it's acting upon information. Uh, it, information, though, I think does belong in the realm of philosophy um, because it's a discipline in itself on how you discover, uh, um, I mean, it's basically statistics, right? It, it's, it's, it's just a little bit, it's statistics with a little bit more hair to it. Um, but it's still just statistics you, of how you know. You like hair. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hairs, hairs is what makes things difficult. Problems get difficult, right? And when you, when you make mistakes, that's how you learn. So, A so hairy you, problem. Hairy problems. Yeah, exactly. You want to, my, my philosophy in life is not to avoid problematic or complex problems. You, you want to go towards them because that's where uh, you, can, you can actually create value, right? If you run away from problems, especially the hairy ones, then, um, then you're not doing, you're not learning, you're not serving anybody just, right? Yeah. yeah, so I mean, I, I have, um, I brought up some of my favorite definitions of information. I mean, in, in my opinion, information is just uh, facts. And, and I kind of agree with Kevin that knowledge is then how you relate things together. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's I, I view them as graphs, basically, I mean, just on a very simple level. But I like this um, this definition. So information is a measure of surprise. The less a receiver expects a message, the more information it conveys. And and I think I mean from the Shan perspective. Um, uh, so uh, sorry, actually, you were talking about this funnel. That's what I wanted to say. So I, I think there's also something that comes prior to raw information or raw data. I don't remember which one you had at the top, which is um, uh, what we call representation. How do we... How How is just raw data? Raw data. But raw data um, also requires some some form of 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 um, interpretation pattern recognition recognition or segmentation it seems to me so so that i mean just the fact that you're filtering out your let's say you if you're hearing sounds you're already doing some kind of filtering because out of all the information or all the data raw data that's out there potentially you're just looking at sound so you're already categorizing so this so, so there's this notion mm-hmm. of representation that already exists that I, I also find quite interesting. Yes, but that, then there's a, uh, there's a huge misunderstanding because now people often talk about that's what you described as a mental model. And, and I think it's dangerous in that sense. Because, yeah, I agree with that. Because, what, because, what people, because, because people say, okay, so you are hearing like some, some sounds and because of how your brain works, uh, you filtering down that sounds to something that is useful for, 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 to, for you to navigate the world, right? So there's necessarily a part of interpretation in, in, in how you process that, that raw data, right? As, as you, as a, as a, uh, an instrument of measure of, of, of the world, right? And, and some people will tell you that this is a mental model. But then you have an issue Whereas the same people often state that mountain models can be changed. So it's just a matter of perspectives. But in that specific case, when we talk about biological ways of processing information, it's just not true. And there's a complete, I, I mean, there's a, um, um, there is a, um, a misunderstanding or a confusion that is made about mountain models as as product of the, the 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 biology of the of the you know of the being, and mental models as uh, as uh, constructs of the mind, which are not the same, because one is something that is inherent to your biological nature, and the other thing is something that you constructed over time, 
which can be cultural and uh, social and whatever the, 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 the level you are, the, the granularity you want to to, to, to so I'm not it. quite sure I understood your, your distinction there, to be, to be honest. But I think the distinction I'm trying to make. <clears throat> yes, you. And then, and then uh, uh, relating things. And, and all these things are, are quite distinct uh, activities. So if you're doing machine learning or whatever, and you, you, you have columns, you have fields, different fields, uh, well, uh, you know, to obtain these fields, you've already in some way parsed the world, and, and that's, or you've segmented the, the, the world in, yes. in some way. Yes. Now that's what I was saying, but I didn't quite understand yes. the distinction. Yes, but that yeah. works in the, in, the, in, the, in the specific of machine learning because there's someone designing the, the algorithm. So the, whatever the filter you, 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 you specify for your algorithm, it, you know, there's, there's an originator of it, which is the individuals that, that developed it. Well, I, I was just making a distinction when we talk about humans and um, how we process information, and we we state that interpreting information is a, is a, an application of mountain models as they are defined. Generally speaking, there is a confusion that is made between what is biologically and therefore physically possible for an organi organisms to to do, and what is constructed by society, which are two different things that. Most people believing or arguing terms are tend to to use. I think I lost you. Hmm. Yeah. Do you do you mean now? <laughs> Did you hear the? Yeah, came back to, but I think that there's a, yeah. Yeah, there's a there's a there's a missing piece in there though, right? Which is well, not missing, but there's the notion of the receiver, right? Which is the thing that is receiving the data and the filtering that that receiver does, whether it's biological or even algorithmic made by humans, I wouldn't in either case consider to be a mental model. That, that, that the mental model is, for lack of a better term, upstream of that in terms of like, there might be a mental model at play which sets the filters in an algorithmic case, or there might be something upstream in terms of biological history. But in in either in neither of those cases would I consider that filtering to be a mental model, right? Yeah, I'm, agree, I'm basically agreeing with you, except I don't. I don't even in even in an algorithmic sense where somebody says a filter of the receiver, I wouldn't say that that's a mental model either. Yeah, but I know that Jonathan was not making. Theory. He was not making the point. I, I made it, so it's it's on me, Jonathan. I, we are not <laughs> discussing about what you said about mental models. I was just adding yeah. that 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 bit to. To the to the to the subject. Sorry, sorry, Matt. Go ahead. So, I actually want to make a very nuanced point that actually ties both of your disagreements into an agreement. Um, and and this this nuanced point actually has a little bit of physics. So you know, Jonathan, you're a physicist, so you correct me if I'm wrong. Okay? But um, the unit of decibels, right, is used in many different fields. In fact, this is actually a very good example of where design in this application of using this concept of using decibels is actually a very useful construct. Um, and what is decibels? Decibels is really just a log base 10 of a, of a ratio of what your measurement is divided by whatever this reference measurement would be. So for sound, right? It's your lowest, uh, or it's a reference sound of, of you know, um, what the what the lowest threshold of what a human detectable sound would be. That's that's the denominator, and then whatever this is, that's what the sensors you know show in terms of sound pressure and whatnot. And the the same goes, you know, with you know the uh, the Shannon um, equations, right? It's still the same log ratios. So, um, and, and when you go into like signal processing, the same decibel um, unit appears. It's almost the exact same equation. It's just so going back 
back to mental models, what Kevin's been mentioning here is, is that in, in, in all of these disciplines, this denominator is, is the mental model. It's the reference point, right, essentially. And whatever measurements on the top, that's also constructed by a lot of, you know, um, you know the, 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 the constraints of sensors, right? And, and whatever the instrument that is used to kind of detect the difference. The important thing, at least what the utility of this unit of decibels is to really just show that the, the, the relationship is, is only significant as a log, as, as, a, as a base 10 type of movement. So it's like, it has to be something that is 10 times more um, in order for it to have a, a measurable, like a, a, a relative detection. So us as biological creatures, right? This is how we kind of operate is that we don't really tell it, we can't really find a difference between like a, a pressure point that is 1% greater, but we will feel a difference if it's 10 times greater. So, um, yeah. I, I, I hope you can correct me. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of trailed off a little bit there at the end. Jonathan? But uh, yeah, I mean, Kevin, what, what do you think about that? The, the whole idea that, um, that essentially mental models are, even though they have to change, there's still um, kind of the fundamental basis of how you want to apply uh, any kind of qu quantitative measure or, you know, any kind of these types of tests, right? Yeah, well, I'm not a big fan of, of the concepts of mental models because they are, they are not properly, I mean, they are not explaining anything to me. Like, they, it's, they, they have, like, a lack of, like, it, it's, it's a bit the gut of the, of the gap explanation of, something we mean like there's some kind of prior thing to what we are trying to do and therefore it, it, it biases in that sense what we are what you know the the and the output of the of the process and the, i mean the, there's a um, an explanation but i feel like it is too often used as a replacement word for meaning other things like so I, i'm not a huge fan of mental models for, for that but i agree that because because of our intentionality, we have like uh, necessarily we will bring up some preferences up, upon what we how we will uh, the type of instruments or the type of of tools we put in place for achieving that even just the intent of understanding the world and say I want to understand everything about the world and therefore I want to be the least biased possible. But then, as soon as you try to do something, you you necessarily do it through what is accessible to you at the point you are trying to do it, and that means that there's no blank slate. That you start from something that is non-perfect in that sense, right? So, um, I, I can only agree with that statement and, and that idea. Now, I, I will distinguish something like if we talk about man, mental models as a thing coming from how we interpret the world and especially things that are that, that are constructed by ox, our experiences of the world right so it's 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 in that sense it's really like a construct of the mind that helps us navigate through experiences right which is a bit different from a, a purely biological standpoint where we here we add experiences on top right in that sense, we can make a distinction between the data, the means through which we get the data, and how we interpret the data. And everything is imperfect. So there's necessarily some losses somewhere, some 
misunderstandings, some misinterpretations and, and stuff like that. The fact is, it's, it's only a big problem if you have no mechanisms in place to correct that over time. That means you, you, are, you know you're never perfect, but it's never the point to be perfect. It's the point to, you know, always learn how to improve the way you do things, right? So in that sense, it's never perfect. Now, the, 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 the trap in that thinking is to believe that at some point we'll be perfect in that understanding and the way we do things and to believe that, uh, like to negate the, the effect of the imperfection of the, of the system or of the process. But I would say it's uh, the extremes, yeah, right? <laughs> my, my question though is, so I, I am like, I'm a believer of mental models. Um, in that Me too. In that they're useful for reframing. And to me, the idea yes. that you are putting yourself in a space where you can look at something from more than one angle should, in fact, at least in my view, erase that notion of per 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 um, perfection. Because it, yes. it, like it, it should. It, and so in a way, I find them actually an antidote to the problem that you're describing because it should bring up this kind of notion of relative, of, you know, like I don't, I don't see, because I'm gathering multiple mental models built right into that is the notion that none of them are, per, are perfect. But, but, oh, with a smirk. <laughs> we are too far. So, uh, yeah, Mark, we just lost you. Yeah, I, I know. I saw that. It gave me a. It gave me. It gave me a, a notice. But now I'm back. <laughs> because apparently, somebody else who's listening is on your side, Kevin, and finds what I just said about mental models. Just I have, <laughs> well, I, 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 I think if we're talking about about this, I I quite like. Maybe we can bring in so this um, uh, so David Deutsch, who's a physicist, yeah. talks yes. about. Constructor theory. You know how the source of, of, of theories, or I, I'm not quite sure what you would say the difference is between a mental model and a theory. I, I'm not quite clear mm -hmm. on, on that, but let's, for, for the sake of it, just say it's the same thing for the time being. Is, yeah, that's exactly uh, the issue I was describing with mental models. <laughs> but wait, <laughs> go ahead, Jonathan. Sorry. So it, the, it's the idea that he basically goes against empiricism and, and the, the, this. Uh, you know, the, this inductive process, he bases a lot of his uh, thinking on Karl Popper and, and he, he was, Karl Popper was the first to talk about this and, and he, he kind of refines it a bit. And the idea is that it, what is the real source of knowledge is, is conjecture and conjecture within some kind of dialectic. So conjecture with criticism, with, uh, and so you have this, this feedback loop. And 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 I, and I think I mean conjecture is because you were saying I thought you were kind of contradictory before Kevin because you said, ah. you said um, I don't understand mental models don't explain stuff and for me mental models precisely is explanation I mean I don't see how you would uh, how you would ex uh, you know how can you explain yeah. things differently yeah. for me a mental model relates okay. concepts together yeah. and I, it explains how. I, I, okay, I would just precise. I, I don't say I don't say mental models does not exist. I'm just saying that they are used in different ways, which are not the same things. So sometimes they are used to describe some kind of of mechanism, and 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 sometimes they are used as 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 a as a material representation of uh, of a bias or of a process, like say when you are like limited by your features as an organism and you state that the fact that this limitation will bring some biases in how you interpret the world is a mental model is not the same thing as saying that how yes, we so constructed a, a, a theory and the biases that can go in that is the same nature than uh, is the same type of mental models than the one we described before as, as a purely physical thing, like which is totally different in the sense that one is constructed over time and through different means and different uh, things like culture, um, 
places places in the world and whatever yeah, you, so the you debate, say. I know exactly I know exactly what you're talking about, Kevin. And, and, and okay. the debate here is actually we've left philosophy now and we're now into cognitive science and it, it, in the debate between computationalism yes. and uh, in, uh, what is what's it called? Fourie cognition and embedded, uh, you know, inactive cognition embodied activism and all this stuff inactivism and and by the inactivism cognition. exactly yes. and, and and i think that's 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 in, i mean i think that's definitely an interesting uh, uh idea but i i don't think really you know I, I think in the end the mental models are in your head you know where else can they be ha huh, you know that's an excellent question uh, and it's, i think it's mental exactly models are in your head and and of course uh, within the these debates. mental models, you are, uh, you know, I mean, yeah. When when you can explain with the same thing two different things, there's a problem in your explanation. Like there, there's clearly an issue. I don't see how you mental can see the are, issue uh, of being able to explain like many different things with the same concept, which does not apply in the same way in the different context well, i mean a, like there's, there's a real issue there. abstraction is totally fine i mean if, it, if this is the map is not the territory business I agree mean, it, the whole point of understanding is reducing you know the the world into a model if you don't do that yeah. you are the whole world you are but, the universe and but, you're, you're, you're but, useful to no one okay right? okay okay I, I i hear what you say i agree with you like the thing is like i agree with you i'm just in agreement in the use of the term mental models in that sense, but th it's not a big deal. I mean, it doesn't change anything about how we understand together the situation because because you can use mental models, I can use another term, and we we find agreement in the end anyway. So it's not really the point. I'm just saying there's different things that mental models try to describe, and because of that, it create it can create like I, I see some issue when you talk about mental models as a biological limitation of the of the of the being then you put the burden of the change upon something that cannot be changed, which is a big issue. Like for me, it's a big ethical issue to, to believe in mental models and the fact that we can change them whenever we want. And then we apply it to a biological limitation of the being and you, want, you expect the same thing from the, out, from the process. I mean, it's, it's, it's unethical to, 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 uh, to go through that line. To my opinion, I'm just not sure I understand that that what you just said. Okay, so, so so if you believe in mental model, and you say okay, now we you think in terms of product, and this is your the way you see the world, and therefore it's a mental model, right? Yeah, I'm not just I'm not distorting the the what you 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 mean by mental model. If you think like in terms of a you have a product thinking, and you you see things as as products and how they interact with the world as products, then we can say it's a mental model, right? Uh, yeah. Although, although I'm, I mean, I'm not quite sure. If I knew what the, you know, what kind of mental models we build, then I'd probably be a millionaire because I could, you know, build a general artificial intelligence or something. But no, 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 no. Just, just okay. Bear, bear with me. So, you you say. If I think that everything is like the iPhone and this is the way I explain things, it's a kind of mental model, right? I'm, I'm attributing features of the world to something I can relate to and I create some kind of model that works for me and explains things for me and therefore it's kind of mental model. And so I can't, and pretty, one specific. That's a, naive, that's a pretty naive approach to the world. Right? No, no, no. This, yeah, yeah, I agree. It's, 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 it's a totally hammer, agree. It's a hammer, hammer nail problem, right? Yes, but 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 there's something in the in the in in mental models that we we agree on the fact that we can change them if we want. So we can say now I don't think in terms of the iPhone. I think in terms of uh, systems or whatever, whatever you'd pick another point of view, right? As, as you mentioned before, like you can change your mo mental models, you can switch them, it's not a problem, right? Uh, I mean, yeah, I think you can change your mental models, but I think some things, for instance, are, are, are kind of hard-coded, you know? Uh, so for instance, object permanence, uh, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, something smaller 
can fit into something bigger, but not the other way around. I mean, these kinds of like basic relationships, I think they're encoded uh, genetically, basically. So, so I don't know. I mean, I don't know up to where you go with uh, with this notion of changing mental models. Of course, we can change mental models because I can believe in mental models today and change my mind tomorrow. I mean, I can. So, yes. my mental so, model about you know. So, so you say you say before like. Uh, a theory is a, a form of mental model. So if we ch we find a better theory, it's it we change our mental model about. I think so. Yeah. Okay. But it's, the, yeah. but it's this notion that you like have one. No, 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 no. Really, you you don't have that's, necessarily that's, one. That's what I mean. It's like they're they're useful, and, and in a way, it goes back to this notion of placements. Yes. Right. We were talking about whatever a couple of weeks ago. Right. This. Yep. This new, that you have a temporary frame that you can apply to a situation yes. because you understand things like the law of large numbers or and something like that. Seen as a large number problem, it gives me a yes. different perspective on this than that. But, you know, whether or not, I think there are like, like, yeah, like, like you, 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 like when you drive, you have a certain mental model that you apply for driving. And when you, you stop driving and you come out of your car, it takes some time to, being another like frame of mind right and we can call that uh, a mental model because you you are in a specific situation applying some kind of model that works for you but then you change situation you need to apply another another model and you can change uh like frames of references uh depending on context and I, i'm fine with that explanation but you see we can explain that all of that without the term mental model and it works perfectly fine now just okay, saying okay. That, but that's now you're just talking about like arbitrariness of language right we we've decided to call something something call mental models because yes that becomes something that can be i mean i understand but, that, that but, but i'm making that i'm making a point right, between different I'm, I'm trying to make a point on the fact that if we agree that mental model is that thing that we just discussed about right now yeah, yeah. and then you say that you apply this to something that is inherently oh sorry yes go ahead but actually, I, just to, yeah, I just wanted to uh, just, uh explain this this one point uh just real quick oh sorry you're you're, I, you're, something you're, said, you're been, breaking up mentioned, uh, earlier are you, do you guys hear him properly i don't i hear like yeah I, yeah you're breaking up a bit matt you maybe it's, it's, Put it, try and unmute yourself and mute yourself again, yeah. Oh. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to step away in uh, six minutes. Yes. Yeah, me too. We have to stop. <laughs> <laughs> it's really interesting, but we have to stop at some point, right? <laughs> hey, Matt. Yeah. No. Unfortunately. You hear me? Ah, yeah. No, yeah, it's... Okay. No. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, um, so Kevin mentioned something really interesting um, a while back. He said that there are two... That, that there's a hierarchy of mental models. For instance, um, the mental model that is used in which, um, you know, with humans, when it's useful to uh, view... Um, the relationship between like one sensory uh, input versus another, that relative difference, that's something where uh, the, the usefulness is proven because it was created in order to be useful, right? So, so it's been proven in the process of the creation. I think that there's many different types of mental, it's, it's really good to talk about mental models because this is not something that is actually very described in information theory. In information theory, they talk about bits and how to like see, you know, uh, how, how efficient is it to get from data. Right? But, but mental models is about uh, your uh, intentionality. You can use mental models to be an engineer and kind of use information to be applied to something. Or you can um, use mental models to kind of improve the theory itself by um, by like getting into cracks 
that uh, that theory doesn't touch. Or you can just use mental model and try to test um, reaction in, in systems, kind of like a mental model of virality, right? Of what how to create memes that go viral and stuff like that. So I mean, I think mental models really just depends on your a, a very huge chunk of a mental model. I think has to be owed to this intentionality. I think like, you know, I guess like 20 or 30 percent of it um, is attributed to an intention. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I mean, but I think we're, we're int intentional, purposeful beings, just as animals are. And, and I think mental models are essential in the way we, um, we behave. And uh, yeah. So if I just may just look, so the, the like mental models, basically they are described as a, as a, as the process of making decisions about the world, right? If, if we simplify it down to. No, they're representations. Uh, that's how I see them. It's, it's simple. Yes. It, it goes back yes. to symbols. It's, it's creating uh, symbols out of patterns yeah. and, and relating these, these regularities between them. Self. But they have a property that we attribute them to is to be we are able to change those right now. There's something that is important to understand is that we apply the same diff, like the same words and not only the word but the meaning of it to other things that cannot be changed and that are still part of how we process the world. Which like we uh, like uh, in a in a presentation of someone t discussing about mental models. Um, they were discussing about uh, parallelidory or parallelite. You okay, saw you know, yeah. when we, we, we see faces, uh, when we see faces uh, on, on things that, that are not faces, but looks like uh, we interpret it as, as a face, right? Yeah. And, and they say it's a mental model. And from, and from a, a purely uh, neuroscientific point of view, this is described as a, as a mental model. But, but in the, on, the, on the other side, we have this other meaning of mental models that are the ones more from uh, a cultural and, and, and so social aspect of it, which are not the same thing. Because, because in the, the case of the, of the Paralidoli, we cannot change how we perceive the world on that specific instance. We cannot not see the face. We see the face. That, that's how we are. As as a human being, and 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 the 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 derivative of the implication of being able to change, like is unethical in the sense of, you know, if we if we expect people to be to be able to change, but there's some inherent feature of our us as organisms that cannot be changed, then we put pressure on organism on, on these individuals to change about something that cannot be changed, and and this is where I see. I see. To personally, I see there's a there's a confusion not not in your way of using it, but generally speaking, how the, uh, how this concept is used. I mean, this yeah. is where my you mean from a moral standpoint. Yes, like if you okay, like you no, know, I think there's something subtle. I think there's something subtle in here in terms of kind of like slavery was adopting hate back in the day, right? I, I, I think adopting a model versus changing the model. I just want to be clear on the language because I think it's important at this point. So something like you described is an, an involuntary adaptation of a model, right? And so what they would try and do in that case would be to train the person out of that model. So it's not the model itself that gets changed. It's the adoption of that model as a way of seeing the world. So just subtly, I want to talk about the difference between this notion of like changing the model and changing the model by which you're looking at the world. And I know it's subtle, but I think it's important in this particular case because what you're pointing to is an, is like an, a kind of a, a way of, it, this is a non-deliberate thing that happens that then yes. makes you see the world in a certain way. And if you split that, then you can say that there are, you know, non-deliberate ways of seeing the world and that there are deliberate ways of seeing the world. And in that case, the models themselves still exist as these things that are 
like, and, and, I, and I don't think they're theories. I don't think models are theories. I think in and of themselves, they are imperfect ways of, of reducing information so that the world can be dealt with, right? Yeah. And I think, and, and, I'm yeah. not, and I know nothing about neuropsychology or anything like that, but I just draw that line between the two because they become more similar than and less different. Yes, and, and they, they co-evolve, like the, the intentional model that we create are, are because of who, like, as, as, as human beings and, and our intrinsic, yeah. like, way of seeing the world that are inherent to the feature of, the, of our bodies and, you know, the yeah. way we can actually, like, in a physical term, process the world, um, we create models on top of that that I'm yeah. fine we call them mental models because they are created. But mm. some are the byproduct of how we are and we cannot change those. You cannot not see the face. You can train people to not see the face, but it just doesn't change that. Naturally speaking, like this is some kind of thing that we do because it's useful for us as a species. Yeah. And, well, and I just, so that, that's the whole thing is like, I think that we... Uh, adopt models that exist i don't think that we like and yeah we might reformat them and rename them and do those things but it's not the same as saying like i'm creating them i mean i guess you can kind of create a model but for me that's not really like to me the law of large numbers is a fact large numbers behave differently than than uh, small numbers uh, when you work on them or things like uh exponential you know things that are exponential right? Like, like viruses behave a certain way. They will behave a certain way, whether or not I understand the model. And to me, the model is just the fact that I understand that that natural, how that natural thing behaves. Right. And so I may also have a model about, um, uh, or adopt a model about economic theory, right? Based on yes. economics. That again is about kind of observation and saying, well, we're trying to put a phenomenon to this. It doesn't explain everything, but it allows us to reduce enough information so that we can act. Right. And I think yes. that, you know, so I just, yeah, but, I, I, but, I, feel like but, I feel like they're formed. I feel like they're formed things as opposed to things that we make up on the fly. Yes. Right? But do, do you see the, I mean, you know, ethical I, I, aspects I, I, of what I meant is like, like the, 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 the burden of the change is, is pushed, uh, uh, you know, towards the individuals in that sense, but there's some physical limitation on how we can change ourselves, like, like physical one, uh, right? I, I mean, there's, there's no, yeah. there's something like, um, intuitive and like physical, physical to it. Like you cannot change the, some things that you, that you, how you perceive some things. It's not possible. But, then, but then Kevin we, we, said let, we land in eugenics and no one wants to talk about that. So yeah. we, we, <laughs> We we don't land in that side side, but just no, but to say, it, it, what, what's the message a... then? We should we should not uh, not talk about mental models from a, a, a big, from a moral standpoint. Is it, I mean, what's the takeaway? Oh, um, no, 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 no. I, I'm fine with using the term, but we we like the, because of the confusion of the of the use of the term, like the usage of the term. Um, I, I want to draw this distinction I make between something that that we create on top of how we function as a as a as an organism and and as species, and 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 the things that are you know inherent to how we are shaped and how does it it it, it you know it uh, it um, impact the way we process the world, and I make just this, this distinction because. Because then I feel like in in a in an extreme direction that's not so far to to get in, uh, there is a there is an issue with this idea that it's up to people to change their minds, because because the extension of that with with biological things is is immoral to me. Well, I mean, McDonald's uh, exploits the fact that you know we uh, we like fat and sugar, and I mean. This happens all the time. I mean, I, and I think there's different. I mean, can you change metals, something about that? Can you change something about that? But, well, that's. A, I mean, for me, it's kind of. A, these are two completely separate uh, discussions, in my opinion. I mean, the 
you know, understanding it, like the is or distinction, you know, okay, understanding yes. how things are is one thing. Right. It's, it's know, positive economics versus normative economics. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but, you know, Kevin started off with ethics and I, 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 I kind of understand where he's coming from. He, he started off with ethics saying that, um, you know, you want to apply design uh, and then if you are not, even if you have good intentions, but you don't have the foresight of seeing how it interacts in a complex domain, it, uh, it spirals off and you, there are consequences. And so there has to be ethical component about um, mental models. Even though you don't want to use mental models for ethics, you're using mental models to apply into reality, right? Otherwise, you're using mental models just to enjoy, you know, the aesthetics of life or nature, mm -hmm. whatever. But if you're going to apply it to the world, then there will be ethical consequences. It's like mental models were useful in creating the atom bomb. And clearly there are, you know, consequences <laughs> there uh, for humanity throughout, right? So, uh, so can we agree that ethics then is the most important subfield for design? Is that the <laughs> so? I mean, I I just would like to say that in my opinion, it's you know you're better off understanding reality better and really being conscious about the mental models both that you are using and that you're interpreting the world with in order to then consciously decide decide to your course of action rather than avoiding this knowledge and and just you know saying we're going to be good people or something i mean mm. i i don't believe in that myself yeah that's personal yeah i think, yeah. I think no, we can I mean, agree it's, it's, yeah. it's choosing not to be ignorant right that's basically it but with the, with this you know practical rationality that there's always a threshold to knowledge in action and it's totally oh, contextual yeah. like the more time you take it's, it's knowing something is is the risk of not making decisions and the and the more you make decisions is the risk of not knowing something right so you are there's a like a balance between the two and i i agree with you jonathan i totally agree with you i guess yeah i, I guess this is the the the, the a, a good point yeah Good, so I'll switch my camera on then. <laughs> right, I've, got, I've, got a, um, I've got a jet. This has been uh, yeah. illuminating. Um, yeah, but this was a long one. It's the, it's the longest. It was three hours long, yeah. I yeah. <laughs> that doesn't work. Uh, appreciate it. I uh, look forward to the next time. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. And good, nice yeah, good discussion. Good. It was great. Yeah, good to meet you, Matt. Matt. Thanks for your input today, Matt. That was awesome. Nice to meet you guys, too. Okay, appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, I'll definitely be back. Thank Thank you for the very nice discussion. Jonathan, you were saying something? Myself or uh, Jonathan? Oh. Well, it's just it's just you and me, Kevin. Okay. Is there anything you want to wrap up with? Because you're saying this off to YouTube. Do you want you know the last final words? What's up? What's up? What's on your mind? No, that's Actually, a good question. question. If, if you were the dictator for a, a full day and you can make everybody do or believe one thing and then you can, you know, you stop being dictator, but they will keep on doing that one thing or believing that one thing, what would you uh, have them do? Or <laughs> believe in? <laughs> I think I, I I think I don't like this question. <laughs> uh, that's a good you, one. You should make it part of this community thing where you ask this question at the end of uh, of uh, to to wh whoever is the last person who's on. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> just make it just make it part of like this YouTube thing, right? Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. I think I would I would make them believe in something totally absurd in order for them to understand that they can believe in absurd things. And so maybe be care more wow. careful, more careful about wow. okay. believing in absurd things. Okay, okay. That's very interesting because, because 
within philosophy, this whole idea of embracing the absurd is is a very existential, um, you yes. know, Albert Camus type of uh, philosophy. And, you know, we should probably bring that up next time. <laughs> yes, <what's funny? laughs> Embracing the absurd, because, I, I mean, I like, I like your answer, because it definitely has, it's, it's well informed in that direction. So we should bring that up. We should bring that up. Okay. Okay. So I hope to see you next time then because you want me to answer that question or what? Sorry. So, sorry. I didn't, sorry. Uh, uh, I didn't get the question. Sorry. Oh, d did you want me to answer that question or, or what? Oh yeah, that, that, yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. What, what do you think is, uh, the thing that you, you would make them believe? Oh, see, the the standard answer, of course, I would be saying is like, oh, you know, world peace or whatever, or <laughs> uh, climate change. But you no, know, I, I would actually have them kind of think about this one particular, I would ask them a question, right? I would just basically do a big survey, a, a big, huge survey. And, and this is the one question I would ask them is if, Warren Buffett is 93 years old and has is worth 130 billion dollars. Would you trade places with him? That's what I would ask to every person, right? Wow. And I would get a big survey. And wow. I would get the answer. And if if they all would, in my opinion, none of them would trade places, right? Because you value your time over the money, and, mm. and when you do that calculation. It's an economic calculation, right? You've made a choice, yes. a rational choice, which is uh, I will forego about a billion dollars per year so that I can experience my life the way I choose. And if you, yes. if you add up a billion dollars per person who said no to that choice, that's the amount of value that we have on this earth, right? That is not... Uh, I think world GDP is about like a hundred trillion uh, dollars, but this is on the order of like septillion or sextillion, right? Yes. So this is several order of magnitudes greater, and so that's the question I would ask. Yeah, you, you, yeah, you, you would get the type of result you mentioned if you, if you average the results, right? But yeah. it won't be true. If you let come, like if you would let some patterns emerge uh, from the answer, like uh, is the youngest people would answer the same thing as the old oldest people in the population, and some maybe no, some I trends will would exist, like some conflicting answers would exist, but the medium the the median. Uh, or the no, the the average answer is the one you said you said before. The average is yeah is something, but well, but then most you of have them would to, say no. Right. You have two opposites, like yeah, you have two opposites. Yeah, well, yeah, they would cancel one one out with one another. But I think my I think the point of my question is is to help them not take it that seriously it's kind of like an absurd question right like kind of like what you would say yeah like you would yeah you would make them believe in something absurd so that they realize the absurdity and <laughs> my question my survey actually has the same exact the same exact breadth as that yes which is that this question is just an absurd question uh, yeah it's, it's but, there's no real answer to it yeah. Yes. But in that sense, in fact, every single one of our decisions that we make daily, you know, in order to make money, right, is in a form a micro question of this grander question, which is really just an absurd question, right? Yes. Like how you make money, what your decisions that you make from an ethical standpoint, uh, from an aesthetic standpoint, you know, whether or not this is actually making you happy or not. Like we hurt ourselves just so we can make money, right? 
Yes. But it's a but, it's a micro question of whether or not we want to be like, you know, Bill Gates or Warren Buffett at the end of, <laughs> at the end of the day, and or getting closer to that goal. And you know, that's you know, I, I would just leave it at that. Is that the question itself is not important, but just taking it uh, fully. Um, again, it's like you said that the end result would be that they would have a higher understanding from the absurdity. Yes. Yeah. Truth. Because also it, it trick it, like it, it questions values of two things that yes. sounds like like they are difficult difficult to evaluate themselves, right? There's something like time and, and money. How much money is enough, you know, and how much time is enough in that sense. And and the like the the simplest answer is infinite of both, right? Which seems like yeah. the best answer, but you know it's impossible. So you, ha what is the like this relates to I would say to context and it's only like value the value of those two things are important in context and this is where I was getting at to say maybe some part of the population would answer differently because their perception the value they put in time for instance is not exactly like it's not the same as for like for younger people than for older people because all the people right. already had a lot of time to realize that time is something way more valuable than, you know, well, not only time, but time with the loved ones and time with, you know, about things that are important in life from that perspective is more important than money. But maybe for younger people, the answer would be different because their perception is that they have time and, money is what they, de they, they don't necessarily have. And to make the same quality of life, you know, and realize at the end of your life that you had the good quality of life requires money. And this, this makes judgments about values in context. And I think it's really interesting. And it's even more true today, no, but there's, a, dis like there's a, a real disconnection between, um, you know, generations uh, because, you know, because of technology because and of how we relate, yeah. yeah, and how we relate to how we relate to 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 reality and life, you know, through technologies. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's really interesting. Yeah, it's really interesting. I love this answer. You know, it, the, the, I think that a key thing is um, that I don't have to be a dictator of the world in order yes. to ask and force people 